sing opera to start the show? I think a lot of people really, would really enjoy that. Don't know very much opera. Yeah, I mean, got like a, a lingering throat infection. Let's sing yeah. some opera <laughs> just before I record like six hours yeah. of collaboration videos. Yeah, we uh, got you packed full today. I, I just realized how disrespectful that is to your healing process. <laughs> you it's okay. It he didn't do the NLSS yesterday, so he'll be fine. Yeah, yeah I, t- I took yesterday off, so. You're just a lazy ass. Welcome to the Roundtable Podcast, everybody, <laughs> for uh, April 3rd, 2015. Wow. I know calendars. And, uh, some... Wow. Sad Where? news. Sad news. We're all going to have to cancel the podcast. Yep. Aww. It was a good run. Yeah, five episodes seems to be you know kind of the threshold for things. I mean, most of our Let's Play series only run for five episodes, so I suppose it's hey. to be expected, but... True. April this... Fools! You can't do an <laughs> April Fools <laughs> joke. It's still April! All of That's April is April works. Fool's right, month. So here's the problem with that whole joke. No, this video is no, going live no on April 3rd, that. and we're recording this before it's even April. Early access you, people you are still missed, in the season, buddy. You missed yeah, the day. It's for them. And early access is going to be the second, man. Mm-hmm. Early, the me. second is like the day that you reveal all the jokes. So I gave them the joke and the reveal all within 15 seconds. I can't wait for all the Facebook posts. Says, I'm pregnant <laughs> for like a whole day. Every year, I had a male friend in high school who would post, I'm pregnant. And he would wear a fat suit and post pictures. And every year he got bigger as as he put on the the fat suit. (laughs) So he was just like, eventually he got to the point where sadly he didn't even have to put the fat suit on. He was just posting oh, no. pictures of himself, and he was just saying, "That's I'm kind pregnant. of funny." He really yeah. got into character. He did. Yeah, he was committed to the joke heavily. Uh, welcome to the show, everyone. So good to have you here again. I'm Bear Taffy, joined by Northern Lion Reikley, Reikley, Tricycle Trikel, Reik- Smile, Look, and Matt Call me Games. whatever. Call me oh. Rick. <laughs> Torkel Torkelson. Torkel <laughs> Torkelson. That callback. Nice. Yes. And uh, we are very happy to have you joining us again. We're going to be talking about a few games today, uh, as well as some topics revolving around Twitch including uh, the YouTube live streaming resurgence. A lot of you may have heard about the uh, YouTube getting into more heavily the gaming side of things. Uh, We're also going to be talking about Captain Forever Remix a little bit. Uh, Discourse, which we were all finding before the recording, that apparently it has a lot more, you know, variety to it than we initially suspected. So that's an exciting topic. And uh, a little bit of touching on Pillars of Eternity, and then the big one for this block. I I always want to say week. Which you can make it weak by heading over to patreon.com slash roundtable, potentially getting us close to that $2,500 goal, the milestone nice. which will allow us to become a weekly program. Thank you very much to all the supporters over there. But uh, other than that, how are you guys doing? Pretty good. Feeling okay? What's going on over there, buddy? Matt, this has got a problem, it looks yeah, like. Yeah, that's... Something... <laughs> This is a terrible noise that scared the shit out of me and woke my eyes. Dude, you haven't slept for like 48 hours. I'm pretty sure <laughs> He's you hallucinating. Were, yeah. No, no, no. They just opened the garage over there and like it made a horrible like dying animal sound. They let the ghost out. Mm-hmm. They let the ghost out. And it scared Maya and it scared me. So Animals but, can feel things like that before they actually I'm very. Them. I'm going to be very jumpy today. Get some sleep, man. <laughs> I will after we're done. <laughs> you, t- you take a nap. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back and record the rest of the show. I, I'm not hallucinating yet. Mm-hmm. So what's the we'll big the topic of, of the week? The big topic of the well, hey, you know, you, you gotta do that uh, plug again. You gotta say a big week. Big week? topic of the Fortnite is the mm. Fortnite. Appropriate. Fortnightly doth we decree. YouTube has gotten back into the live broadcasting territory. Ah, yes. Well, uh, that kind of rhymed. Did it? Ooh. Decree and territory. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Thanks stretch, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> you did a good job, Bear. Thanks, man. It I've was got, a close miss. I got a lot of Dr. Seuss in me. Don't don't think <laughs> about that. <laughs> Would you like to? Yeah. There you go. As proof of its seriousness into the YouTube uh, live streaming resurgence, they've already hired over 50 streaming savvy engineers. YouTube is looking to get back into live streaming by way of focusing more on esports and the gaming side of things. Shock, shock, surprise, surprise for a whole lot of people. Uh, and in place of responding to a report from Ars Technica, YouTube representatives sent them an animated gif of a little girl shrugging her shoulders, which I like a lot, but... It's pretty good. This report being what it is, uh, tell me, guys, would YouTube resurfacing in the live streaming, uh, area 
in the form of it being a gaming slash esports focused thing. Does that incline you to A, look into live streaming on YouTube more and B, look into viewing live streams on YouTube more? Yeah, I mean, the reason that I stopped streaming on YouTube, I originally started streaming on YouTube because it's your, all your audience is there to start with for most people anyway. So it was really convenient to get people to the streams, but the stream uh, functionality was just so far behind Twitch. Like you can talk about Twitch's chat delay, like the streamer has like a 10 second delay before chat actually sees what they see. On YouTube, it was like the chat didn't even work. It would load in like discrete two minute bursts. So like if you yeah. saw something happen at like two minutes into the stream, chat would load like a hundred messages at four oh, minutes and just push it all off. Yeah, yeah. It, it was the worst. Um, the video quality was actually fine. And I think it's like watching streams on YouTube. I've watched some non-gaming streams on YouTube lately. It, it's fine if you're not chatting, but mm. uh, if as a consumer, if YouTube kind of doubles down on making chat work for gaming related streams, I'd be interested in watching. Whether or not I'd be interested in the streaming depends on a lot of things. Whether or not it, it works and, yeah. you know, how the Twi Twitch's trajectory in the next like year or so, depending, you know, this, this could be something that's like six to eight to 12 to forever months away. Um, you know, how it relates to existing networks that we may or may not be partnered with, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, at, at least it's. Unlike some of the other competitors in the streaming community, at least it has the kind of traffic built in already that it can mm -hmm. compete with Twitch on kind of like a scale level, which mm -hmm. the, if you go to some of the other competitors right now, it's like, well, you're going to be starting from zero if you have an existing audience on Twitch, basically. Right. Right. I mean, it's, it's, I think the big thing that YouTube <clears throat> needs to do is just make it really, outside of obviously making it work properly, uh, what's going to get people to stream on YouTube is just making it super convenient. I'm on YouTube most of my day anyway, and for me to go over to Twitch, I mean, it's like, oh God, you have to boot up OBS and it's, you have to go to another website, and it sounds like it's just like a pathetic, a few extra baby steps, but to cut those baby steps out and just be like, I'm, gonna, I'm already on YouTube and I'm just gonna hit the stream button while I have OBS loaded up, making it that much more convenient while making it functional and making chat work could be enough to push certain people, lazy people like me, to stream on YouTube more than I stream on Twitch because like Ryan said, my audience is there as somebody who is mostly just a YouTuber um, to, to stream on YouTube where my audience is and as long as you make it convenient would be enough to make me go, hey, you know what, I might as well just stream on YouTube while I'm at it. Mm. Well, I don't know why it has to be one or the other. I mean, there are ways you could actually parallel stream to both. And let's not forget also that, you know, Twitch has a whole system already built up to help you monetize. There's subscriber stuff. There's all kinds of other, you know, side add-on things that YouTube hasn't even kind of really broached into the community of yet. So I would just want to wait and see what they do with all of that stuff. And if they're interested in competing on that kind of a level, then maybe down the line I'll see when it comes to contracts where I go with things. <laughs> Right, there, I mean, that, there yeah. are ways to parallel stream, but most Twitch partnership contracts have exclusivity on Twitch built into yeah. them. Yeah, no, I mean, later down the line to see if that <clears> could <throat> be negotiated or what. I mean, a lot of this yeah, is right. hypothetical, too. We don't know what, like you said, we don't know what YouTube is going to do when it comes to doing, uh, you know, monetization and being able yeah. to do subscription models. We don't know. I'm assuming they'll be aiming for something to be somewhat equal to or equivalent to Twitch. Um, another argument I read recently is like, well, what about YouTube's copyright system and all that stuff? And I still sit in the camp. I honestly still sit in the camp that people who think that's not going to hit Twitch eventually are in dreamland. That shit already has. has. It already yeah. started to, yeah, but I think... But it's not as bad, but it's definitely It's not begun. as bad because it's not as li live, but I really do think that eventually it's going to hit live streams and not just VODs. It's going to be more cracked down as these lawyers as these companies decide to say yo they're still using they're using our music even during a live stream they shouldn't allow it we shouldn't run the, any commercials they run will be going to us this that and the other um and if that's going to be part of day one youtube streaming or not i don't know um but if it is i mean people will be like well just stay on twitch but i think it'll hit twitch eventually anyway so hit you in I wonder if that sounds really possible. dangerous <laughs> i don't know protect yeah your protect your vods Always protect your vods YouTube, I, I mean, okay, so the, the focus is very centric right now, as far as we can tell from their live streaming reboot, of uh, broadcasting events. And that's kind of been what YouTube live streaming has focused primarily on, not just in the <clears throat> gaming aspect of things, but also with, uh, you know, they've done the presidential debate stuff on there from time to time. They do concerts very frequently, which Twitch award shows. is getting into a little bit as well. Yeah, award shows, things like that. So I don't think t YouTube is really concerning itself very much with 
uh, you know, monetization for streaming partners and making the interactivity more enjoyable. I think they're, like Ryan said, like they already had a good footing as far as the quality of the broadcasts and the ways in which they want to deliver the primary mechanism of allowing people to consume content live on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But another big thing about it would probably be how YouTube obviously is not a site where people go to consume live content. They're, they're doing this as a sort of branching out. Unlike Twitch, who are established as you come here to view live things and that's what the entire focus is. So I'm, I'm curious to see whether or not they are going to try to dive into those aspects of it more. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to see if they want to improve upon their god-awful, abysmal chat interactivity system. I mean, it's... Yeah. It's That's step just one. yeah, it's just as useful to leave a comment on a YouTube video on like a million view YouTube video as it is to try to chat in a <laughs> YouTube live stream. It's just It's very true, yeah. It does nothing yeah. for you. The only yeah. upside was that it was actually all archived, right? Once the stream was over, you could yeah. go and look at all of them. So, I mean, I would have kind of liked if that was an option on Twitch as well, but also it's not that important either. What's I think the elephant in the room here to some extent and like don't take this as me bad-mouthing Twitch, but in the last year or so, Twitch has gotten worse. Like, the, mm -hmm. the service of viewing on Twitch has gotten worse with the, the chat delay. And I don't know, it, maybe it hasn't gotten worse as a partner, but there's been stuff like the music changes. And then even though it's out of their hands somewhat, like the recent security breach didn't <laughs> help matters very much right. either. No. So I almost feel like this news is kind of conveniently timed. That YouTube is like, well, we, we're a company with a lot of resources and a lot of built-in audience here that probably can compete and confidence in Twitch is probably lower than it's been at any point in like right. the past couple of years. So it, it seems like a good time to try to capitalize on that. Mind you, YouTube streaming sucked like yeah. really badly. So they have an uphill battle when it comes exactly. to Exactly. Like I feel like there's this innate kind of like underdog appreciation that people have. They're like, yeah, fuck Twitch. But then <laughs> like YouTube As is like, watching well, we're going to. Right, yeah. Like, yeah, Twitch sucks. Like, I only spend like eight hours a day on it, and it pays like my bills. But then people are like, you know, Hitbox. No, yeah, right. let's go to Hitbox. Whoa, YouTube's getting involved. Uh, fuck YouTube. I think maybe Twitch is so bad. Like, I, I feel like people, I that if YouTube. A I think. Like, if YouTube does streaming really well, I don't know who people are gonna hate anymore. I don't know how it's going to work. You hate but I think, both, man. You hate the man. I guess you just, mm -hmm. you just hate the man. Who's the man among us? Who do we need to hate here? Who's? It's Matt. Uh, it? yeah. I would say if there's any question, <laughs> just go to Ryan's audience. Fuck that Matt. Matt, this Matt guy. shrugged, dude. You Clearly just like, you me. fucking accepted it instantly as soon as I presented <laughs> that. This is like, there was no question. Who do we hate? Uh, the guy that we're trying to raise $50,000 to fire yeah, <laughs> is the I answer. Mean, it's a valid goal, right? Uh, That's uh, an interesting little no nugget <laughs> Thanks, from the. Uh, <laughs> it's like I still like I still like you. Oh God, don't do that. I didn't want them to hear. <laughs> don't eat the microphone. Mm. Uh, <laughs> an interesting uh, perspective from the back end to note. Uh, if you are, I don't know if this is My exclusive favorite. to YouTube partners or not. Which you know, saying you we I'm are a YouTube partner, I, you don't really need to qualify that anymore these days. I'm pretty sure they've lowered the standards. Significantly enough to where I uploaded it's like three years ago. I started a channel. I know I uploaded one one video that was just a slideshow of ferrets I didn't own, and I got partnered instantly. They they partnered <laughs> me right, noticed, a, right away. We noticed you have one view on your video. Would you like to put ads <laughs> on that? That's incredible. Video? Well done. It's it's Did like a song fair. in the background. This ferret slideshow. Yeah, <laughs> like Home Sweet Home by Motley Crue or something. Oh, you've seen to... it. Is that video still up? Because it's going to blow up now. Yeah, it is dude. now. I had, you know what? This is a true story. I had a video uh, of my dog. This was a few years ago. She's passed away since. But I had a video of my dog where I was just being an idiot. And I was, like, laying down in front of her trying to get her to speak and stuff. It was really just so stupid. It got, like, 50,000 views. And <laughs> nice. I, got, I was, like, ashamed of it, so I deleted it. But oh, it, was, no. what? it was like oh. generally well received too, and yeah, now funny. it's gone forever. Because YouTube was... cash is cat and animal videos. Oh yeah, and liquefied thumbnails. Mm. We're it. working on that. All of those <laughs> things. Uh, there's one more thing I want to bring up, and that's about the whole infrastructure of streaming on one versus the other. 
Uh, if you're dealing with Twitch, you're dealing directly with Twitch, but if you're a gaming content channel on YouTube, you're probably dealing with an MCN that's de then dealing with YouTube. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's this extra layer of kind of confusion about how the contract splits work and whether or not revenue share is going to be as viable on one versus the other. So I was just kind of curious what your guys' input was on that whole thing. Mm. I did want to make I like... mention before I got into that whole uh, video about my dog thing, I was going to say the uh, you can see in the back end of the analytics report that they're actually starting to separate a little bit more the uh, the identities of live streaming revenue against on demand stuff. They even have a tab on there oh, okay. that says on demand now as opposed to live. So when they're building out things like that, it leads me to believe that they are trying to work in an infrastructure, which is good that they're doing this now because it seemed like the first time that the live streaming booted up, it was so terrible that it was maybe more of a, a an open beta test without it having that right. exact language. So that is curious to me of whether or not they are going to you know dive into uh, that a little bit more just based on those I'm, little nuggets. I'm trying to think... Um... I don't know. If, you sure if, are. If I, well, no, like I'm trying to think how I want to approach this because we have contracts with our MCNs and those contracts, I don't, I mean, they may vary from person to person clearly, but I don't know if they cover live streaming. Machinima My last definitely did, had clauses that said, uh, it was like, <laughs> Ryan, Ryan's face. Right. I just you don't have true, to, man. nobody has to say anything about any of this and we're not going to blow you up or anything. I know it's Northern just... Lions contract in particular has okay. a clause. He shared it with all <laughs> oh, of us. I can only speak for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no, they... think mine does. There may or may not have been contractual amendments presented. Okay. That had live streaming in them. Yeah. Yeah. So. Contracts existed in the past. How's that? Is that better phrasing? <laughs> Across many MCNs that did very specifically state they wanted to create an exclusivity deal with YouTube live streaming, which I know was a major turnoff for a lot of folks, myself included. I saw that and I had to kind of amend that deal because I was getting into Twitch partnership at the time too. So, yeah, it's uh, it's been... It's okay. So the there's two sides to this. There's the side where YouTube just focuses entirely on event broadcasting, like we mentioned. They just make it so you can watch the large tournaments on a grander scale because YouTube's audience just brings in so much stuff. Like they throw a banner on top of their website, and that is potentially being viewed by billions at a time, and that is the kind of draw that sites like Twitch really can't bring at the moment. So I tend to lean toward that reality as opposed to them. I mean, like, again, those those analytics data things are kind of telling for the potential future of, uh, you know, partnership with YouTube being more integrated with live broadcasting. But I tend to lean more toward the idea that they're going to be focused primarily on events for the ongoing future as opposed to trying to get back into the competing with Twitch side of things. I mean, they did specifically say they're getting into video games with a focus on esports. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're looking at esports <clears> events, <throat> probably, you know, League of Legends World Championship, Dota World Championship, StarCraft, all that stuff. That's something you just throw a banner up and be like, you can just go watch this. It's a huge event. Go watch yeah. it right now if you're into it, as opposed to worrying about the individual streamer. I mean, again, it's all, you know, wishy washy. We don't know. We'll see what happens in the next six months to a year. Um, but it's interesting to think about because you, I think you're right. That whole you'd be able to just throw a banner up and be like, "This is happening now," well, and then millions of eyes promotion on Twitch. Twitch. Same yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, but Twitch gets like one percent of the viewership. Oh, yeah, I mean, same idea though. That's all. Yeah. No, that's I, not, actually, yeah. I I agree with Matt. This I think that there again. I don't need the lamp shit. I'm talking about hitbox. There have been but, yeah, like no, there have been competitive the, the competitors that have risen up for Twitch that take kind of like a streamers. First approach. That they're going to try to like popular. siphon, not siphon because it sounds kind of malicious, but they're going to try to entice streamers to leave Twitch yeah. and bring their audiences to Hitbox. YouTube is very much going to work in the opposite direction, as far as I can tell. Because it's not an exaggeration to say that the monetization on YouTube compared to Twitch, with the same audience, you might make literally like a hundred times more on Twitch. Yeah. Like that was. That was a big difference, and it, you know it's not the difference between making like a thousand and a million dollars, or yeah, right. thousand, yeah. If you're, if you're partnered at a very small level on YouTube, say that you have like two thousand subscribers or something, you're probably pulling in, uh, you know, like fifty bucks a month at that's, a good that's amount. Generous. Yeah. That's so generous. 
the I, YouTube is going to have no problem getting viewers. The question is whether or not they'll be able to get this, the kind of like variety and personality focused streamers because without offering, like even if you could get double the viewers on YouTube streaming or five times the viewers without something like a direct funding model like subscriptions, you're, you, you can't make up the difference in what those streamers will make on Twitch via subscriptions probably. So I, I really can't see them managing to do anything but events, at least right off the bat, without having some kind of direct fan funding model, and, which they kind of have on YouTube, but yeah, hasn't they're really, starting to get into that a little bit. It hasn't thinking, really reached any kind of like, no. like zenith yet. And the other thing I'm thinking, the Hitbox didn't have that YouTube has, especially when it comes to just thinking of esports events and you know being into that scene is is money, money. Yeah. yeah youtube can just be like yeah you're gonna run the league of legends world championship and you're only gonna stream it on youtube because here's multiple Here, thousands here's of dollars a truckload of money we'll and now to you in a now you bed. just exclusively will stream it this event on youtube because we paid you the money to do so mm -hmm. and they're gonna that's that's a good way just to start boosting an audience right there i mean hitbox can't do that and another interesting perspective on it all is to consider again the fact that Google was very much in play to purchase Twitch. Yeah, remember that, those horror yeah. stories back in the day before Amazon swooped in was the hero remember, of all mankind. The, the sky is falling, the world is burning. Mm -hmm. Panic mm -hmm. that was happening. It was, it was legit kind of scary though. Hey, yeah, I mean, there's, I found it to be. That's that's a whole other debate, of course. But yeah, if we had been a podcast are, are those back people... then. The, the, we don't need to be having this conversation for those people because they won't go to YouTube. Like, mm -hmm. if YouTube, even if it has a totally, like, viable streaming platform, they prefer to diversify and keep, you know, half of their eggs in one basket, half of their bags in the other, their, half of their eggs in another half basket. And that's, <laughs> half their bags in another box, and that's, uh, there's totally fine. You know, there's validity in that, for sure. But mm -hmm. Well, I didn't even want to necessarily note on that. What I wanted to speculate on is whether or not these changes would have taken place if Google had acquired Twitch. Probably and not. I think... No, no. This, <laughs> no? <laughs> no. I think because they would, they, would, they would own it. So they, why would they need to compete with their own? It'd be mm. the same thing as like World of Warcraft 2 announced and being released. They'd just be feeding off their own subscribers of World of Warcraft 1. That'd be no point. Like Google, mm. after they bought YouTube, they phased out Google Video. It, like, yeah. Yeah. If only they'd get rid of Google+. Plus. <laughs> yeah, the, the one big difference, though, that I think is also worth noting as far as, like, fostering smaller, more personality-driven streams is that there's not really much in the way of community or support when it comes to YouTube. And it does kind of require a little bit of one-to-one -one interaction occasionally between the platform and the streamers. And YouTube just doesn't care. Like, oh, their yeah. support is non-existent. So that's mm -hmm. why they can take a hands-off approach with big events. But I just don't see them interacting with individuals unless they're, you know, the giant freaking names that's why they can reply to uh report requests or comment requests on reports from ars technica with gifs of little girls shrugging yeah. their shoulders <laughs> yeah right. that's i think i actually got a youtube support email with that exact gif one time i've got three uh copyright strikes on my channel can you guys help me out like sorry they they don't by. care <laughs> ad rev for a third party yeah so, all right, so that definitely uh, leads into our second discussion point here of whether or not we all feel Twitch actually does need some level of competition. I think we've gotten to kind of a synopsis that YouTube is going to be focused more on the events broadcasting, probably actually going to be... I think they're really just going to steal all of the major events that Twitch mm -hmm. has done. Like We yeah. touched on that, too. Like They can just... They have the power to do so, and why it's, wouldn't they do it? It's going to be money. That's what's mm -hmm. going to convince them. There's no other way for them to compete, especially if they're both, a, a big event is going to stream on both platforms. There's no way I don't think YouTube could really compete. Sure, they'll have an audience, but with Twitch, because people go, what it's going to take is here's 200 grand mm -hmm. or more, depending on the event. It's going to be exclusively on, exclusively on YouTube. Nobody else is going to be able to watch it. And as much as you hate YouTube, if you are into the league, just as an example, League of Legends World Championship and YouTube purchases the rights to stream the World Championships on YouTube, you're going to go watch it because mm -hmm. you're not going to have any other choice unless you want to wait a week and see like VODs elsewhere. It's just going to be a, here's cash, done. This might be a little That's bit of a tinfoil hat argument, but I can't help but wonder whether or not the, uh, the divergence of the things like Ultra being broadcast on Twitch right now, I think they're really just very quickly and desperately trying to test the waters because they can feel 
YouTube breathing down their necks is just this giant beast of a thing that's mm -hmm. saying, hey, those are cute little events you're doing. I'm just going to go ahead and... I, I they want to build some relationships quickly before they don't have the, the chance anymore to get mm -hmm. their foot in there. Yeah, see, I kind of saw it the other way, that it was Twitch's way of kind of, like, not taking on YouTube, but starting to, like, slowly kind of bleed into a more generalized approach to streaming that maybe could make them, like, the YouTube of streaming as opposed to just, like, the mm -hmm. YouTube of video game streaming. I didn't take that as them, like, trying to like diversify so that they have an escape route if YouTube comes right. into gaming, but rather just so that they could have kind of a wider appeal. But it's it's all speculation one way or the other, I guess. It's a little of both too. Yeah. I I wonder how much they do rely on the I I'll, so a primary example would be something like the international. So obviously mm -hmm. a massive tournament, huge scale. If YouTube just comes in I well, first of all, you got to wonder whether whether or not again they have something like an exclusivity deal with Twitch, where they're saying like we will broadcast this event on Twitch for the next five years, blah blah blah, right, regardless right. of competition. But if they don't have something like that, if YouTube just comes in and says, "Hey, Steam, we'll broadcast this to billions of people," I I don't say no to that if I'm Steam, which means Twitch is SOL with one of the biggest. Probably one of the biggest money makers. I I gotta say it's probably gonna be like a giant chunk of change as far as their annual report is concerned. So that and yeah, that's what I always think is the international League of Legends. Like those two mm -hmm. world, you know, it's just crazy. Yeah, it's gotta be the international. For those who don't know, is a uh, massive Dota tournament, Dota two tournament. Uh, it got millions, I think, millions of viewers at some points mm -hmm. over the course of like the grand finals going on things like that giant prize pool it's a huge event it's massive it's the kind of thing that probably brings tons of new viewership to twitch as well i mean like they get that site traffic a lot of metrics that they probably present to shareholders and people like that yeah. depend on huge scale events it, to drive that sort of traffic Though it kills every other stream in existence. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's just kind of a and negative it's, side effect. It's to it. such a big event that it's almost like people are citing it as something that's legitimizing esports as mainstream entertainment is kind of where they're headed. Yeah. So to put it into perspective, I think it's a little too early to say that YouTube will do that. Yeah. But I agree that it's mentally there's like no barrier to stop them mm -hmm. that I know of at least. And you know, it, it sounds like it is a little like conspiracy theory ish, but that's exactly the way that broadcasting rights work in like sports. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll, you'll have sports networks that will bid hundreds of millions of dollars for the contracts to show NHL games or, you know, NFL yeah. games in, in specific markets and stuff like that. I mean, I think it's maybe a little quaint to think that, you know, our industry is too small to, to warrant that same We're kind of... We're too polite to do that. <laughs> right? Like, this is games. We don't do that stuff. These guys are all just meeting in a small little room talking over a <laughs> laptop, yeah, right? right? No, it's... Uh, honestly, something like the International could become maybe even the Super Bowl of esports where these giant uh, companies, like, there's only two really major players in there at the moment right now, but maybe they swap hands, you know, like things like the way the Super Bowl works right now is there are three large broadcasting networks. I think it's NBC, Fox, and I want to say CBS is the third one. And they actually take turns. The agreement is they take turns broadcasting the Super Bowl. So that, something like that could happen where, you know, next year it's broadcast on YouTube and next year it's broadcast yeah. on Twitch. That seems probably a lot more far-fetched than the idea of YouTube even coming in to try to take those things away. That's just, you know, much further speculation. But that's becoming a legitimate uh, possibility, which is very interesting to say the least. At the same time, you know, YouTube, I think we would all agree that especially Google, its parent company, has... A lot of money. I, I think I could agree that say. Google has a lot of yeah. money, yeah. <laughs> but it's not like it would be Google going against Twitch. It would be the YouTube division of Google going against Twitch, which is itself almost like a subsidiary of Amazon, which is also a rich company. And you don't know, like maybe YouTube Whose would. Pockets are deeper. Mm. Well, I think probably Google's, but the question would be <laughs> yeah. like whether or not you know, YouTube would feel comfortable devoting like X percent of its budget to buying an event. Whereas for Twitch, you could probably make the case that holding on to something like the international is more important to them and, and maybe justifies a larger expense. Mm. Or maybe even, you know, a company like Valve might say, 
it's been awesome to work with Twitch, and the international's gone off mostly without a hitch the past few years. Like, why mess with uh, a good thing? So mm. it's it's all like it theory crafting right now. But yeah. yeah, definitely, Valve's kind of getting into the broadcasting game now that we Steam broadcasting. It. I people keep talking about it, but I don't think it's ever going to be like the way Twitch is or the way YouTube is. At least it's a super like far away off from that right now. Yeah. All I've seen Steam Broadcasting used for right now is, like, help me get through this part of the game or pop up a notification while I'm trying to record that's, like, somebody wants to watch you play Rebirth while you're recording a Rebirth run that people are going to see the next day I can't anyway. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> or porn. You know, I should start doing that. Instead of, right. Sky- I should start, instead of Skyping you, just be like, can I watch you play Rebirth? <laughs> Dude, you should, sell, you should sell friend invites to your Steam account. Hey, ooh, And then nice. you can get oh, the early scoop on your Isaac episodes. Oh, there, are, there are content creators that. That, have, that have done that. <laughs> oh, um, I've got the $15 that Patreon tier. You can oh, add no. Northern Line on Steam and watch <laughs> no. the Rebirth happen live. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, no. Uh, Maybe if we hit 50 <laughs> I mean, if we can get Mathis, then, then I can hire over. Mathis to be yeah. like my admin guy on Steam. He can direct all the requests. <laughs> oh God, no, please. Um, I mean, back to the to the to the root question. I think, to, I mean, if you want to wrap up the conversation, is is competition good? I think competition is always good. It's going to force Twitch to. It's forcing Twitch to be better, because if they're not better, they'll just fall by the wayside. So and that's, the, I don't think that'll ever happen with Twitch. They honestly. need it. Yeah, they yeah. Need, like they do. I, I do feel, and I, if you look at my responses to things like, I mean, we're going back like a year, but if you look at my responses to like the outrage of Google potentially buying Twitch, I'm almost like, I'm like the pro corporation guy. Do you have your tweets I was, printed I was out as like notes really you can refer to? That like, yeah, <laughs> yes, right, 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 <laughs> on March 17th, 2014. No, but like, I'm like, you know. What people yeah. I think have an innate or learned kind of distrust for big businesses, which is fine, and I think in many cases big businesses have kind of like earned it. Brought but with themselves. Twitch, I I actually do feel like they've maybe not gotten complacent, but I feel like their service has gotten worse in the past year. Yeah. And um, like the the music stuff, I I give them the benefit of the doubt over that. I don't think you're gonna find a company that wants to get huge. That is going to be like, oh no, we're going to go like toe to toe with like copyright Icon, holders and stuff like, like that. Yeah. Exactly, it's just not going to happen. Like that's the realities of getting to a, a certain size. Mm-hmm. And if if Hitbox gets to that size, they're going to have to deal with that shit too. And anyone that mm-hmm. thinks they won't is just kind of deluding themselves. But the chat delay is still crazy. And forever it was like, oh, well, that's just like a temporary glitch in the system as we work it out and it's yeah. like a year later and it's still like, happening. Shh, don't talk about it. They'll forget. Dude, it's yeah. not even the chat delay as much as it is just that there's something broken about the site every single day oh, on yeah. a stream. It, That's true, it's yeah. It's always something broken. It's, there's login errors. There's people getting other people's dashboards. There's yeah, that's a scary one. not working. <laughs> I was trying to stream kinds of things. a week ago and for the first time ever, like, the, the, every 20 minutes, it, the stream just crashed. And I was like, it sucks. Yeah, just, not oh. loading. That yep. happens pretty frequently. I mean, you're like, best picnic baskets but like, everywhere, man. Mm. They're good with their support. They're generally pretty yeah. transparent about what they do when they try to make it, you know, reasonably quick resolution. But if we could just have like a few weeks where there's not any problems, that would be nice. Mm. It really has been. There, there were weeks day. like that in like 2013 and 2014. You would have like a month with no issue on Twitch. Right. It hasn't happened recently, and I don't think anyone's trying to say that like running a site like this is easy. No, not at I mean, all. There was like that they did have that like shareholder kind of memo that they printed up that was like Twitch is responsible for like two percent of all data transmitted on the internet in the United yeah. States. It's crazy. <laughs> like yeah, that's that a massive. ton of data, mm-hmm. and it, it's still not an enormous company, even though they have a lot of money. But at the same time. If competition provides a better service and puts pressure on Twitch to provide a better service, then that's good as well. And I would rather see Twitch succeed than see them get pushed out by this competition. But the most right. important thing is just having the best service that we can have as, as yeah. a viewer and as a streamer. So Don't get me wrong. I love Twitch. It's my favorite thing. It's so good to work with them. Like for all the negative things, it's so much. Like support is a huge issue. That on YouTube, you just you can't get anybody. Yeah. And on Twitch, in like ten minutes, someone will respond to you. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. they're they're definitely the devil and the angel as far as that's concerned. Like Twitch is still. Well, I mean that also leads me into the devil's advocate argument almost of with Twitch still maybe even being 
quote unquote in its infancy to the point where they're still able to address people on an individual level right now that kind of goes away when they grow up and uh, expand to the point of I, I obviously we're not going to even try to compare them still to YouTube I think people kind of don't understand how insane it is to try to make that comparison right now by the way kind of off of an, a tangent here but yeah. YouTube is all right, hold on. Visual aids here. Let's say YouTube is this giant bottle of antacid <laughs> for the uh, for the audio only oh, listeners. Like I'm holding a oh, giant Kirkland, bottle yeah. of Kirkland brand. So this is the Costco shit. So you know this thing's yeah. fucking huge. Sponsor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then like Twitch is probably like the. So you see this battery here. You see that little oh, yeah. a little nub Kirkland. on top of that. Yeah, oh, the nub. <laughs> I'm trying to get Costco in on this business, man. But then. <laughs> This is that little nub right there. That's probably where Twitch is in comparison. That might so they be have the but... what you're saying. Uh, they have the luxury of being able to respond to everybody. Yeah. yeah. Like, the bigger they get, the harder that's going to be. So then, would a so say we were able to put ourselves into a reality right now where Twitch has two major competitors. We'll call them Snitch Hitbox and, and Hitbox. Hitbox. Twitch, yeah. Snitch, and Hitbox. They're like the three. Big okay. players in the streaming game. It's becoming a math problem, and I'm, I'm terrible at math. If Snitch and Hitbox both travel down the road at 45 miles an hour <laughs> well, with two tons uh, of apples and oranges in the back. Oh, how many subscribers will they gain by the time they reach <laughs> Chicago? Yeah. It depends if they have a text-to-speech generator to read out the names of the subscribers. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that gets you big. So, does Twitch still not have an established enough foothold in whatever area this happens to be of the web to justify that level of competition because i i could present the argument that there's not enough people basically to really allow for three companies to be successful to that size if you split let's assume uniformly you create a twitch 2 snitch mm -hmm. for example twitch and snitch. all audi all audiences that sounds like a really terrible Twitch ftp protocol <laughs> Twitch to snitch. and assume that like all audiences are halved so if you normally got like a thousand viewers now you're going to get 500 and your doppelganger gets like 500 on yeah. snitch it becomes very difficult i think for it, the barrier to being able to stream consistently or even full time becomes a lot higher so it's actually it's like, already hard it is but in a way it's good no, no, yeah, for sure. Because there's no competition. And that I don't saying. mean that as insulting mm -hmm. to Hitbox. Like right now, 98%, 99% of the streaming audience is in one place. Yeah. So, you know, you it's like YouTube. Like you, there's Daily Motion and Vimeo and shit like that, but 99.5% of Remember the days people who are of watching this shit. All the YouTube there. shit going down. Why don't you just upload to Daily Motion? Why don't you just oh, bring your God. audience to Daily Motion, right? Yeah, you're, you're right. right. Just going to Daily Motion. <laughs> it, it's so simple. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> That's why all the big YouTubers are going to daily motion right yeah. now. But, like, it, it becomes very difficult. So competition is good, but it does also come with the risk that if there's two, people, two sites that are, like, evenly matched or have, like, even market share, it does become harder on the streamer as well, unless one of them gets, like, a clear edge and, and gets, like, all the audience. I think, like, competition, people think competition is the ideal. For me, competition is not the ideal. It's, like, competition and then the best one gets 100% of the market share, and then never gets worse. But it never happens. Oh, yeah, that's a great utopia to live in. Can we yeah. go there? <laughs> <laughs> we want competition, but, like, Twi Twitch sees that YouTube is doing... This is the best-case scenario, I think. Twitch sees that YouTube is getting into the live streaming game, double down on infrastructure, yeah. making their service as good as possible, keep almost entirely the, the streaming audience, and then everyone's happy. Otherwise, you need, like, a lot more people to be watching streams in order to make it viable if the audience does get, like, split 50-50. Well, I think that's what you were saying. Like, even if you split it 50-50, it's already going to be hard, while even maintaining 100 of what you have now, I don't think yeah. it's already hard enough. Hmm. Twitch is still, live streaming is still much more of it in its infancy than something like even YouTubing is and yeah. making a full time living off streaming is already fucking hard than it is uh, if you split that in half it's going to be 
fucking even harder. So. I want to say, by the way, that I'm not like shitting on Hitbox. <laughs> like, <that never laughs> I think you've already clarified that a couple yeah, no, of times. I, I, I just want to make sure because people are defensive about it and they should be defensive about it because I don't know anything about it except that whenever I go to it, the top stream it's has like 30 or 40 viewers. It's, it's just, just smaller. It's just a fact. It's just a fact yeah. that, that Hitbox doesn't have the capital to spend to make it competitive right now. Maybe Hitbox will have its own niche audience in like a few years, but as of right now, it's so small in a market that's already tiny. So there's really no, there's no, I don't want to say there's no room for it, but they just don't have the leverage that they want. And it didn't help that, it didn't Hitbox, I mean, this is getting into a tangent, but it didn't Hitbox come nefariously from like uh, uh, owned? Streaming, yeah. which had its own problems. Oh, People yeah, were like, whoa, yeah. I don't want to worry about that. From, from what I understand, there was like owned, owned 3D, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, they had a staff member who really mismanaged their finances. And the core of owned went on to make Hitbox, but without that staff member. Okay. Mm -hmm. But still, that. like the they specter of that has kind of followed them. Yeah, around. I remember when Hitbox came out, people were like, don't go to Hitbox. It's just owned people doing it again, and they're just going to scam you out of money. And I'm like, I don't even... I don't know. People don't realize like, Hitbox is actually an abbreviation for... Hey, I threw Barry out. Barry was the finance guy that yeah. fucked everything nice. up. Kisses. Excellent. <laughs> and then, you know, they've been just been going from that. I also have oh, to mention, I know this comment has already been written, but I know I pulled an ATM machine move by saying F FTP protocol, so please don't oh. roast me over the fire for that. <laughs> What's interesting to note, you were saying, again, about like Twitch being in their infancy, something we don't realize, Twitch was started in 2011. Mm -hmm. Like, they've only been around, they haven't even been around for four years. Yeah. They're They're still so young, so... I think, really, we may be getting the ideal circumstance here as far as hoping that Twitch will buckle down and begin to really work on building out its existing infrastructure and trying to make things better as they are right now as opposed to trying to grow into this massive multimedia conglomerate. Like, with YouTube being the potential competition to take away some of, their, some of the things they're relying on, then maybe they will end up doubling down on what they have established for, you know, smaller, I don't want to say like smaller markets, but just the, the kind of people that still definitely hold by themselves the power to make Twitch a very strong thing. People like the Syndicate Project, for example, like that's, that's just one guy who yeah. by himself draws millions of eyeballs. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that they can actually work with to maybe even supplant the potential losses of those big money uh, events to YouTube. So there's... I mean, I bet potential. if you look at, like, the personalities, they probably pull in more subscribers per thousand viewers than the events do. Like, just, like someone like, like any of us, we probably pull in more subscribers per thousand viewers. Mind you, they have, like, 500,000 viewers sometimes mm. uh, than, than an event does. Yeah. I would bet that too. Yeah, yeah. I would be. That... You go ahead. Are you sure? I, I'm just, very are sure. You sure? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't, Do you I don't have know, something like, worthwhile like to cut, say? You sound like I, I feel like not. I cut you off. I just feel like I cut you off. I no, I mean, all I was going to say is, I, I'd be curious to see uh, how much of uh, Twitch's budget is, you know, made up by subscription revenue from advertising on oh, yeah. smaller channels because I, I I would love to see that. I yeah, and that would be very interesting and would definitely help us to speculate further as to what Cuz I mean we know. We can expect <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we know what our what our revenue breakdowns are subscribers versus ad revenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would be interested to see if that was reflected across Twitch, or if if you look at a huge stream that's event based if it's like 90% ad revenue. I don't know. See mm. YouTube adopt some sort of like subscription based model. Dude, I'm I've been saying it I've been saying it for like three I know, years. I have two, man. Mm. Especially if they, the way ad revenue is going down lately, like not lately, but like over the course of years. Just yeah, give a, a basic like two dollar subscription, they subscribe to your favorite YouTuber. No, because you have to get content off in order for that to work. I'm saying it's, just yeah. 
I'm just saying subscribe to them and now they don't have to watch ads on any Bingo, of your videos. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like the thing uh, they do for commercial sites, that's like you pay right. this amount per month and you have access to the channel. I thought that's yeah. what you were saying. No, that no, would no, be the no. worst thing ever. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah, no, no, I know that would be terrible. I'm just saying, I'm just saying they have that. you can watch my videos with ads or you can just throw like, give me, like subscribe for a buck or two. Like It's like a be dollar a month would probably right. be yeah, yeah, more you would make from their ad views over the course of 30 days. Exactly. And it's by like a factor of 100. And it would just, oh, that would be, that would be a dream come true but it's it's it, totally off topic it's so like it's win-win unless we're just so ignorant of like the corporate yeah, concept of it that because otherwise i like we're just like why not make food free for everybody <laughs> right <laughs> abolish money but it it's like, i've been saying forever i've been like if you could offer like an a monthly subscription with flexible cents. pricing yeah, so if you were like Discovery Channel, you could be like nine dollars a month or something. If you're us, you could say like a dollar a month, and you get no perks but no ads. There are so many people who would be like a dollar a month to not see ads and maybe absolve guilt over using ad block. Mm -hmm. Like that's not. I don't think the majority of people would make that decision, but I think a lot of people would make that yeah. decision. And like it, people. Yeah. Because one person paying a dollar a month takes care of like fifty people using ad block. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I would, I would be probably more than and that. And admittedly, yeah, like exactly, probably That's a really good point. As I'm a little older, like I have some disposable income, but if I was like, yeah, I like your videos, I would, I would pay a dollar a month to yeah. not have ads in front of your shit for sure. But right now, the choice is like watch ads or have ad block, and the decision is like way too easy for yeah. most people. At least you either have to, you either use ad block or you say like, I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna support this kind of like style of content i want the internet yeah. to still be free i think we all recognize this like it's an extreme inconvenience to have to watch ads <laughs> yeah like, man yeah, we no, there's no doubt sincerely appreciate that like that fucking sucks <laughs> yeah it's so annoying but and yeah to their yeah. to their credit i would imagine that a system that allows you to subscribe for a dollar a month probably cost them money in the long run like the amount of things required probably to process that sort of stuff. I don't know, man. I, I seriously like Patreon, doubt you can, they would... You can pledge, like, a dollar a month on Patreon. Yeah. They already Patreon have a system can... on YouTube where I can gate off content for a subscription. Yeah, but, I mean... Rentals I think... and stuff like that, too, yeah. I doubt they would want to go the PayPal well, route. I don't know why exactly I would say that, but it just seems like... Use Google Wallet. Yeah, probably. I mean, they do something Fuck like Google it, man. Wallet Fuck it, man. Make it for YouTube partners through MCNs or something. I mean, there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way, but I, I just... Sorry, it, doesn't it undermine profitability for the people selling the ads, though, to have yes. there be... Yeah, see, they don't care about anything that undermines that. That's their and number that, one. Yeah. They, they do have that conflict between, like, creators and themselves, or creators and advertisers, I should say, but at the same time, YouTube is a company, and... I, well, I, okay, we're coming from the perspective of people that, like, go to your channel, watch your videos, yeah. and are diehard viewers. I bet that's like 5% of YouTube. I bet 95% right. is like embedded shit on BuzzFeed, like check out this 30 second video right. of this yeah, dude vaping semen, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, that's my favorite cool. video. That's an actual thing. No, yeah, and that definitely happened out, earlier this morning. On Twitch, I was there. like, I, I hate that there's <laughs> like non skippable 30 second ads when you go to the channels on Twitch now. Like it used to be an opt in, opt out thing. Yeah. And then they just grandfathered anybody who had the setting off into like no ads when you go to the channel which i i love not having ads when you go to my channel because whenever i go to a stream and then it, like, there's like a 30 second ad it doesn't matter what it's for yeah like, i was gonna say battlefield hardline but then it just sounds like i'm shitting on like a the circle Usually. jerk over that's just that. the latest mm -hmm. ad exactly so you go you watch a 30 second ad for battlefield hardline and then it's like as an example maybe like you know brotato is offline and you're like well oh. I, just, I just wasted my time <laughs> that's not yeah. brotato's fault but i'm like and it, I, I or the that. stream stutters and you refresh and then it's like, oh, time to watch the ad again. Yeah, yeah. Well, that goes back to, because I was streaming yesterday and somebody mentioned it, that another Twitch problem where they'll send out notifications that you're streaming way late yeah. in the game. And right. you're it's like, like well, I just said and I just watched a 30 second ad and they're not fucking, they're not live. Because your notification is like two hours. The long. annotations yeah. from Twitch to YouTube have been broken for the last month. So every video I'm people watch live. on YouTube <laughs> says I'm live and I'm not. <laughs> So people are just going there and probably seeing ads and leaving. And very soon they're going to realize that annotation's meaningless and it's going to be stop being effective. I think what I have to imagine that we're, we're just incredibly ignorant of like the meetings that go on yeah. between oh, yeah. big video game advertisers and, and the company like Twitch or YouTube. Because for me, if someone pays $5 a month, it's, it would be like 
in my position right now, it's a no-brainer to say no ads when you yeah. watch that channel. Yeah. But they just, like, if you're not grandfathered into it, they will not do it. I, I imagine that's something that maybe, like, a, I don't want to pick a publisher, but, like, a video game publisher was probably like, we're going to do a huge ad buy. And Twitch was like, well, you know, like 5% of a channel's audience won't see that ad. And they're like, oh, that's unacceptable. Mm. Yeah. And you're like, in, okay, instead, 50% won't see it thanks to their use of ad block. You're like, okay, no problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's so stupid. But then Which is Twitch why... Turbo. That's that's exactly actually, that was the argument I was going to make is yeah, something it's... that's probably a lot more likely to show up on the YouTube side of things is the equivalent of t Twitch Turbo. And they're kind of already doing it, too. I'm, I'm guessing you guys have seen on a lot of the music channels, they give you the option to remove ads from viewing the music videos and stuff like that. Oh, for Vivos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Like, I, I think it's actually across everything that YouTube identifies as music. So it could even be an upload of, uh, you know, Everclear on fucking uh, Georgie94's channel from 2008. I love Georgie. Yeah, he's a good guy. And like it still has a little option down there that says, like, you can remove ads from this video just by paying this monthly subscription fee. So I wonder if maybe there could be, like... The potential, I mean, this is again a very utopian style of thinking of YouTube just completely eliminating the ad game and saying, you guys give us eight bucks a month, ads are gone. And then the... Have, have the option. You yeah, can watch yeah. for free with ads or... Yeah. And then you can even say something like, the way Twitch Turbo does it is when the partner runs ads and Twitch, tur with Twitch Turbo viewers are there watching that channel, they are compensated for the Turbo view, I guess. I mean, and, and again, those are freaking fractions of a fractions of a penny we're talking about as far as that's concerned, but that might be a potential way for YouTube to address the increasing issue of ad block because they've got to be able to recognize that stuff too much like we say we don't really have any idea what sort of meanings go on go on behind closed doors there are people at youtube more than likely on a regular basis trying to identify isolate and diminish problems associated with ad block so yeah i have that, to imagine that's uh something i wish would exist because i would i think like a YouTube Turbo, and this is this is as selfish as I can possibly be. Mm. YouTube Turbo is great for people who watch YouTube, and it doesn't hurt the content creators, but I prefer a system of individual subscriptions that are cheaper overall than like one YouTube subscription because then it, you're actually kind of paying for some free viewers if you subscribe to a channel, if that makes sense. Like I would prefer, I, I'm glad Twitch Turbo exists, but I would prefer to have it in addition to like ad free on a channel if you subscribe because then you're not like you're it's a way of supporting flexibly the the streamer or the content yeah. creator so if you only watch like mathis on youtube you can say like i'll give mathis a dollar a month instead of giving youtube eight dollars a month mm. and then mathis gets like 70 cents of that instead yeah. of what he would get if you right. subscribe to site wide which would be like you know point zero one cents you, per view or something like that. who you want to support it's if you watch one person way more than you watch anybody else and you're like you know what he's buck you know, as opposed to saying, "Hey, YouTube has eight bucks." It's just, it's, it's, you, it's more personal that way. A dollar yeah. means more to us than it does to YouTube. As, as uh, yeah, clearly. To say. Yeah, that's yeah. that's sort of what I'm trying to get at, and that's why things like like Patreon are so good, and like why this is so cool is because people who like really like the content, pay more than they would be paying for it in order to support people who yeah. aren't paying for it. If that makes sense. So the, my problem with Patreon, which is weird to say in a series that's funded <laughs> by Patreon, us on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> is that it still kind of has this culture of like pledge like $10, pledge $20, pledge $100. What I would love to see on YouTube, and by the way, if you're pledging $10, $20, or $100, that's awesome, and mm -hmm. thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. But I would love to see on YouTube like pledge a dollar, and then like you get a benefit of no ads out of it, and like a dollar – is so meaningful from yeah. like an individual viewer on a YouTube scale that like you wouldn't have to have people giving a hundred dollars to support con you wouldn't have to have ten people giving a hundred dollars you would get five thousand people donating a right. dollar instead mm -hmm. but I don't uh, that, maybe I mean, I'm that missing almost it. becomes like a communist line of thinking right like hey if we all put God our sheep into this barn. <laughs> Then we can all just take one sheep, and then we'll share. We'll all share and be, be happy, be friendly, surprised. fun time. 
Maybe YouTube would be surprised how many dollars people want to give. They haven't tried. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what communist is because <laughs> communist is everybody giving a dollar, but then it's also communist. You got like one person giving a hundred and then like a bunch of people freeloading off it. Or is that capitalism? I don't know. I don't even know. All I know is competition for Twitch would be great. <laughs> like, Stay tuned right, for yeah. the next hour in which uh, Roundtable Podcast <laughs> becomes political discourse. But uh, beyond that, I'd like to uh, maybe... Good chat. Diverge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can... Now that we're starting we, to we, yell we, about <laughs> communism, maybe we should start talking about video games again. Uh, you guys, how'd you, like, uh, how'd you like Captain Forever Remix? I don't think we have much to talk about here. I just want to talk about this game for a few minutes because it's really, it's really cute. It's a cool little game. It's really cute. That's yeah, what really I was going to say about it. It's, it's, cute. A, it's a neat, simple idea that's easily replayable and is entertaining for short bursts. Mm -hmm. I am surprised that people are not as into this game as I am. Because Who's not into I, it? You found well, somebody I mean, that hates it? There's like muted, muted mm. positivity. Well, Before you Ryan, say that, Ryan. you should describe yeah. what the game is. Yeah, I was going to say, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. Cap <laughs> Captain Forever Remix is uh, a space shooter uh, that takes place in 360 degrees, kind of similar to Asteroids. But the hook of the game is that you basically build your ship out of modules, which are kind of like Lego parts. So you'll have structural parts, a little bit like Kerbal Space Program too. You have structural parts, boosters which provide thrust and directionality, different kinds of weapons like lasers, cluster lasers like shotguns, Sawblades. melee weapons like saws, beams, stuff like that. So you build your ship out of these, you destroy enemy ships with kind of like asteroid style combat, their modules come off and then you reconfigure your ship with their modules to become stronger and you try to beat like 10 levels and then at the end you fight a final boss kind of similar to FTL but real time. Uh, so that alone, I, when I was playing it, I've probably put in like two, two and a half, three hours thus far. I was like, this is like, not, it's early access by the way, but it's not quite as addictive as something like FTL or something like Rebirth, something like Spelunky, but it's like almost there. Like I've almost got like a Rogue Legacy vibe from it that is like, if there was more of a culture and community around the game, I could see myself putting in like 10, 20 hours fairly easily. Like I think it's right. a really good game. Well, the replayable element is that every time you die, there's actually money that you'll grab that drops along the way, and you can spend that on various things that have long-term potential for making uh, your you know, abilities better. For the uh, One example would be that uh, you only have a certain amount of time to build your ship after you finish each wave or each uh, level, and you can make that longer, so you take a longer time to pre-configure things. And it's not dry or anything. Like It's really simple. It's all physics-based. You click, yeah, you drag. Yeah. Things just snap together in a very like visceral, fun way. It's very satisfying, and, the snap. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a satisfying Whoosh. feeling. And it's really easy to just reconfigure your ship, take it all apart, and just have fun with it. It's not a serious game. It doesn't require a lot of analytical thinking. You just, just play around. feels good. Hmm. Experimentation is key and fun. It, it uh, allows you to have your own fun with it for sure. It, it's, it's I think the biggest maybe, penis ship you can. Yeah, absolutely. Just build a giant dong, and that's that's all you can <laughs> hope to do. I think uh, games like this they're maybe a little bit tougher to get into because so. Okay, here's uh, put another quarter into the compare it to the Binding of Isaac jar. But yes, you're right. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's too. Uh, easy not to make this comparison of so say in a game like the binding of isaac you're playing through and when you acquire new items it just stacks onto what you've already got and you all of a sudden are way more powerful and that happens it goes and goes and goes and then you just this massive beast of a crying child and that's a weird phrase like <laughs> you get to the end and it's like it's oh man on this huge mach machine of death it's awesome but with this, you kind of have to create that yourself. It doesn't just happen where you get through the end of a level and all these modules show up and they're just like, and then you have this massive amazing yeah. ship. You have to decide for yourself in like a span of 60 seconds, okay, so I can build this here and I can make, move all these modules elsewhere. Right. And it's like Matthew said, it kind of puts it on you to make your own fun. So... And you got to break down the ship strategically. If you shoot yeah, the wrong yeah, parts, yeah. you destroy them. You don't get to use those parts anymore. So there's definitely some deeper thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you take too much damage, you lose parts off your yeah, own you ship. Yeah, right. you can completely regress, like, very, very quickly. In, in Isaac, short of picking up, like, soy milk, you're not, there's never going to be an item that you pick up that just flat out ruins your run. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, in Captain Forever Remix, you can just have, like, one, like, weak structural part right next to your command module, and then if that's broken, you lose, like, half of your ship in like a right. second right mm -hmm. it scales so quickly too so it almost 
you know, puts you into positions where you can't help but lose out on some of those big advantages you had. Yeah. It, it'd be like if you had something like Brimstone, Polyphemus, Mom's Knife, and then you got hit by enemies to the point where you're, like, at half health, and then you lost half of those advantages. And that yeah. could be really yeah. dis like discouraging for a lot of people. I think myself included, I actually found I I didn't have as much fun with it because I had put so much investment into it and then like at the snap of your fingers, that was gone, but you were still playing. In a game like Spelunky, you can have a jetpack, 99 bombs right. and a compass mm -hmm. and then die to spikes and you're like, oh, well that sucks. Like I start over. Like the, that game had ended right then. Like that. Yeah. That feeling. It's difficult to describe, yeah. but that feeling is way different from still having right. to try to progress in the same. You feel helpless. Stage. Like all of your yeah. options have been removed, and now you've got to figure out a way to somehow get more parts back, which is just a really steep hill to try and. But and sometimes that can impossible. be mm. that can be really cool though, because and when Nick and I were streaming it, I had a run where I got to like maybe like level six. I ended up losing. Well, I lost every run. But I, I ended up losing, like, on level 6 or level 7. But I had a good ship, and then, like, an enemy beam just cut off, like, half of it. Mm. And then I lost the other half. and Or I, I, like, deliberately, like, got rid of the other half. And then just became, like, one booster. And then, like, my command module. And then a laser beam that just shot, like, straight out. And then I was actually able to, like, pilot behind ships. And then just focus the laser beam on their command module. And it took, like, 15 minutes. But by fighting them there in that way where they, like, didn't have any guns at their back, I'd just, like, find their weak point, I could actually break the command module and then steal their entire ship, basically, and just reconfigure it around my own, which was kind of cool. There are situations where you will come to a ship and there will just be, like, shit shooting in four directions, and you're like, well, okay, I, I right. can't <laughs> beat them yeah. like this. This is just not possible. But it is possible to farm your way back up, almost like, like Spore style. You know, you start as, like, a shitty, like, one-cell ship, basically, and slowly you just conquer ships that are larger than you but it, it's not always possible i agree but that's that's part of the fun as well i think that's that's part of like the rhythm of the game that you don't get the first 15 minutes or so that you play it it's not like you're you're not constantly getting better you're, you'll get better you'll take like five steps forward and then you'll take three steps back and then you'll take one right. step back and then you'll take four steps forward and yeah do continue well that, you know and then there's like other numbers involved in it between zero and nine somewhere you take six steps and then nine steps backward that was really if you right. take too many there steps you back you die oh okay mm. if you take enough steps forward you win usually you'll have a good chance <laughs> you guys yeah are deep i know <laughs> i think it's really good i'm i'm, I'm surprised that I, I i feel like i always take this stance but i'm like i'm surprised that people have like a problem with it not that people necessarily do but um I, I clearly think, does I think it deserves, well, deserves this. I think it should garner more attention than it has garnered thus far. But that's, that's a number of different issues wrapped up with early access and it having kind of a cartoony aesthetic. And some people are not thrilled about the music, which is basically just like a couple of repeating tracks over and over. Yeah. It the gets, uh, it gets you like know, it. a pretty standard early access stamp of approval for me as far as that goes, where I, I really like where it's going. I want to see more of it. So I want to see more variety. I want to see it go deeper with uh, expanding your ship out, like potentially getting yourself like, you know, three or four command modules maybe. See, like what kind of craziness that can cool. hold. So, yeah. I, I mean, when I can chop down trees. Yeah, yeah. That's all <laughs> that. the zombies show up. With the zombie <laughs> God damn it. There's got... actually a game called Space Pirates and Zombies. He'd probably know. love it. I have Ooh, it. Yeah. Of course he has. He got five copies of it. I do. Captain Forever Remix, available in early access right now on Steam. We want to talk about Discourse now. Yeah, let's do that. I'm I excited to talk, talk about, about this. Discourse. This is going to be Played very it this morning. Discourse is a, uh, an interactive choose-your-own-adventure game. Just came out, uh, made by... Ooh, it's uh, Alchemy. I Alchemy, Alchemy Labs. Labs. Yeah, it's a, it's a play on words. I like those. I like owls. Yeah, owls are nice, too. Want to mm. talk about owls instead of this game? I think we should yes. do that. Yes, wait, right. no. Good. <laughs> Uh, the art style is really awesome. I like that quite a bit. I think that's probably not even worth noting beyond that point. But what is worth noting is the fact that we all had very, very different playthroughs the first time we went through the game. So let's uh, start with how the game even starts. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, what's the premise? Mm -hmm. so the idea is from uh, you playing this character named Rita, I believe. Mm -hmm. And well, you playing... played Rita. Yeah. <laughs> I was George. I'm uh, just don't even. Don't even. I'm like, what? I was the cat. No way. Uh, you're 
flying on this plane, plane crashes on a desert island, and you and, like, what, five, six others uh, mm -hmm. are tasked with trying to survive until you are rescued. That is a very basic general premise of how the game is presented. So the best I, way, like, as a comparison that I could describe it is it's, like, a whole season of, like, a Telltale game in, like, a very micro Like an hour. Way. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you play it in, like, an hour, basically. Telltale light. It's not quite as confrontational either as a Telltale game. There are only a couple of moments where, like, you had to make a snap decision. Usually you have plenty of time to think really? about what I, you're doing. I had, I had, like, four snap well, decisions. Well, okay, sorry. My, in my experience, <laughs> because um, they do diverge. And we'll, full clarification, if we're going to talk about this, there will be spoilers. So yeah. if you're into mm -hmm. this idea of a game, you skip ahead or pause it. Yeah, go we'll pick have time it up. stamps. Just we'll go to the next it. thing. Yeah. For those of you who are in that boat, uh, I think we can all say that we recommend we like it. it. Yeah. Check it out, but we are going to talk about our individual experiences too. I will say that I think I probably have the least positive opinion out of anybody, judging from the reaction that I saw on Skype at least. Mm -hmm. I think it's just okay. I think it's it's pretty cool, but there's no way I would play it through more than twice, which for me was like an hour and a half. And I was like, okay, I've, I've seen like I don't know, I haven't seen everything, but I've seen the machinery the behind the curtain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. And, and like in my head, I could say like, okay, if I did this, this is how this would happen. Then mm -hmm. probably not with a hundred percent accuracy, but I've seen enough to not yeah. necessarily want to go back. Well, let's uh, talk about how each of our stories ended. Yeah, you go and first. Then start at the end. end. You want me to go? No, yeah. don't still start with me. Come on now. I played a last. Start from the end and go back to the beginning. That'll be interesting. How'd yours go, Bear? So I uh, actually did a series of mine, so a lot of people may have already seen this if they're watching it on my side of the uh, roundtable yeah. upload, but I, uh, I ended up saving, so there are six characters total, there's Rita, Jolene, George, Steve, Teddy, and Garrett, and there's yeah. a cat. And a cat. And, a cat. and the cat. But apparently the cat doesn't I've have to show up, which is really interesting. But, I've not uh, seen this We're going to figure out why this happens, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think we're going to... I think I know why. I think I do too, maybe, but... I'm probably going to spoil, like, I'm actually playing through it again for the channel, so I'm totally going to spoil for myself, like, every possible <laughs> outcome, so this is going to be really yeah. good, but... Uh, yeah, I, uh... Did you guys get to the part where you had to, uh... You found the tribal village, and you had to elect a leader from the remaining party members? Never, never even heard of that. No, nope. none of you guys got nope. to that point. Wow, that's, no that's tribal awesome. Village for me. I think it depends which direction you go, because it mm -hmm. gives you the option to go to, like, the other side of the island, or to go up the mountain, or, or to build a raft. Or, or to, to build a raft, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you guys all build a the raft, then? Okay, I built Nick a raft. went up the mountain. Yeah. I went up the mountain, and then I built a raft. Okay. How? Oh. I just so built you built a raft, a raft no, no, to go I, down the mountain. Okay. Oh, oh two okay, different two runs. Different, yeah. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> but the first run, because that's like that's your end game condition, right? Is like, do you want to end the game on the raft or do you want to end it on, on the mountain? Yeah. Basically, at least that's yeah. the way it seems. So uh, yeah, I uh, I also before that, prior to uh, accessing the tribal village, I had to go on a hallucinogenic mushroom trip. What? So you guys didn't get to experience that either. Maybe I'll play I this saw the third peyote. time. There was peyote along, along the desert. There's peyote too. Was oh like, man. She said, like, oh, I remember in my college days I thought about trying this, and I never did. <laughs> so maybe she, she takes She refers back to her college days a lot. She really likes to reminisce. Yeah. But, She's like uh, an art buff, but she works at a barista. Yeah. And I can relate. Pretty, pretty stereotypical, if you ask me. Not, not well, all art majors are baristas. Dude, Garrett pissed me off Alchemy. a little bit. Go ahead. <laughs> I had this, when you reached towards the camera... I had I had my own little peyote trip right there. I thought your arm was <laughs> like I saw your arm reach over the into day bear's quill, man. Street, man. <laughs> I was I think it was just that bear's mic arm comes down at like the same angle your hand was <laughs> for for a second. You reached through to bear. <laughs> Both of you are really tripping balls right now, man. I mean, like Ryan's all doped up on anti-viral stuff for his throat, and then Mathis hasn't slept for three days, so. That's fun. <laughs> Three days. Mm. I had to get Over... blood taken this morning, so I'm a little lightheaded wow, too. And okay. I had coffee. I I didn't I didn't realize coffee was like a hallucinogenic drug. No, I mean after being lightheaded, it is now. coffee makes. Did you me have the good. apple juice and nor two chocolate chip cookies after your blood was taken? Yeah, just left. Wow, wow, this big man up in on here. Edge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so back so, to the game. Anyway, yeah, yes. discourse. I uh. I ended up getting Garrett killed because I was incompetent. I, okay. I went to the shipwreck and, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, played through that whole puzzle. I, I failed to lower the water before uh, yeah. allowing him to light off the fireworks oh. to blow up the hole of the ship. And 
Dude, that pissed me off so much. That was real silly. <laughs> hey, it, there is a there's a part where you can choose like where you should go. It's not like a, the first decisions in the game are like food, water, SOS signal, mm-hmm. and then there's like a juncture, and you can choose to go like look for more food. I think it depends what you do in like the early section, mm-hmm. or you can choose to like investigate the shipwreck where there might be more supplies. But there's like a, the only puzzle in the game is in there, and I was like. They're not going to make me lower the water again. Like, in my head, I was like, this guy is good. Like, you move slower during the water, but yeah. it's up. So that sucks. But I was like, I'm going to try it anyway. And he exploded, and I was like, well, I, I, don't, know, I don't even know what the fuck you're talking about Just right swim, now. swim, man. Been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Garrett had, like, the mental capacity to make that determination, especially a the, like that. Garrett was the gamer guy? Yeah. 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 Did you get him hurt? Did you get him to bonk his head onto yes, anything? I did get yep. him to bonk his head. Yeah, I got his he was, belly he was, open. Oh, wow. By you mean at the end? No, nah, in, the, in the early game. You get the decision to hunt the boars or stay at the camp. Yeah, yeah I hunted them too. I was successful. I hunted the boar. Mm-hmm. I hunted the boar. I didn't hunt Garrett the boar. Garrett wasn't there. You didn't encounter a boar? Uh, a boar came to the camp. Okay, Try yeah, to yeah. take our pretzels. To, yeah, it takes lucky. two of your pretzels and then you go after it or don't. Oh, yeah, I didn't go after it. Right. Yeah. So, this is the problem that I have with discourse. Okay. And this is one of the reasons why I don't like it as much as I think conceptually I like it. I could have liked it, I should say. Is because I do feel that there's objectively right and wrong decisions. Admittedly, I've only played it twice. But in the early game, there's a very early fork in the road where you can be like, do, I, do we hunt the boar that stole our pretzels, or do we stay here in case more boars come to protect our existing food? I hunted the boar twice. Actually, I've played through this decision three times. I've hunted the boar twice, though, and every time I brought it back, the meat was diseased. Does everyone yeah. else have that yeah. same yeah. thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I kind of dislike that that's an objectively bad decision. One time, I stayed back and I um, defended the camp, but I messed up one of the prompts, I guess, so one of our people got injured, which I guess is probably something you can do. If you have more skill, you can prevent them from getting hurt. Maybe. I don't know if skill or like any sort of skill point system just, exists i, I think know. it might just be well, all, I, mean, I, uh, I think i you know like when you hunt the boar you have to do that in like a specific order you yeah. have to like distract it then stun it then hit it hmm. yeah that's like i think there was one of those when the boars attack the camp if you wait there like garrett's like i've gotten like my game boy or something like that and you can be like go stay back or you can be like go go hurt them or yeah that, yeah and, there is a there is a specific way you can do it to uh, like let teddy hit him in the head with a metal detector or something and then you then you win that element and i, and I guess like gets injured it, like if you do it yeah. in that order okay mm-hmm. yeah nobody got injured for me either i so, kind of dislike that there's like objectively good and, good bad, and bad choices yeah. but i will say i thought there was an objectively good choice um you know there's a another part fairly early in the game when steve is like let's investigate the plane wreckage yeah yeah he, mm-hmm. he gets on top of the plane it lights on fire and then you got to tell him to jump off or stay on two times i had him jump off both times he was fine then I watched Kate play, and he had or she had him jump off, and then he got struck by lightning when he jumped. Oh, off. Hey, really? So yeah. I had I had the same situation. Oh. I told him to stay on. Oh, did and he? When he stayed on, it started to rain, and he was like, "Oh, thank God, I'm gonna be fine." And then he gets struck by lightning and killed. Maybe that. Maybe she didn't have him jump off. Well, that yeah. sucks again, because like the two oh. times that I had him jump off, one time he was extinguished by the rain and one time he ran into the water and was extinguished by the water so i think it's like objectively good to have him jump jump off which for me kind of inhibits the replayability a little bit because the second time i went through the game i was like well i have to like uh, i have to deliberately make the wrong decisions to see different endings right like to make different things happen i thought you were just going to tell me there were some random elements so i was going to be so happy because then that changes the way the whole game structure yeah that. yeah that would have been nice i think like that's certainly where it uh is different from well we made the comparison to it being kind of a micro telltale style thing and with the telltale games i think they have they have a an overall story that they want to tell with those games so the decisions you make can alter the way things happen, but they can't really alter the main arc of right. the story too much yeah. because obviously then it wouldn't function properly. But with Discourse, it's not so much a... Uh, and They don't necessarily want to tell a story. They just... It's choose right or wrong and do your damnedest to save as many people as you possibly can. Yeah. yeah. So 
you can play through it multiple times and obviously get to an optimal strategy. And that's kind of what they want you to do because, I mean, I, I only say that because there's achievements centered around getting everyone off the island together. And, oh. yeah, it's, I mean, if there were sort of RNG elements, if there were, just like, ways to make it more interesting, I think that would allow for further playthroughs beyond just the two or three that it likely requires right. to figure out yeah. what exactly you have to do. Although, to its credit, I guess it's kind of impressive that for all four of us, well, I, I assume maybe Mathis didn't get to this point of playing through it multiple times. I, I played it once. Okay, but... That's it. Well, okay, so I'll pose that question to you again. Are you, are you interested and in, like, invested enough to want to do it again? I didn't plan on playing it again a second time, but games like that, Telltale Story-like games, I like to play once and be like, that's my story, yeah. and I'm done. Yeah, same that's with me. I, I didn't do. really want to play it again. Also, I felt kind of emotionally attached to some of the characters until the way they reacted to certain situations just seemed mm -hmm. so insane to me. Yes. So, like, I was on the mountain, ready to climb up to the, the summit, and there were two sleeping bags, and it was me and uh, the, the couple, the husband and wife, Okay, yeah. And because of the way things had played out earlier, I had not given food to her, but I had to her husband. So she put me in this situation where it's like, I don't care what you say, I'm taking a sleeping bag because you didn't feed me. So I was like, all right, I guess I'm giving you a sleeping bag and I'm going to take the other one. I didn't realize that was going <laughs> to kill her husband. So yeah. when I woke up, she was like, oh, guess my husband's dead. Do you want to eat him? I was like, what the? F are you serious? <laughs> See, That's I tried to climb up the I tried to climb up the mountain, but uh, because of decisions earlier, I was missing an arm, so I couldn't. You were missing an arm. You were you were yeah. missing wow. an arm. You didn't meet yeah. the cat. How did all this shit go down? <laughs> so like, the reason I was missing an arm is because you know when you're at camp and a storm hits. That's yeah. oh, did a tree fall on you? No. So a storm okay. hits, and basically the guy who's like a paranoid guy is like, "We gotta go. It's Eddie. a test or whatever." I listened to him. I'm like, let's just go. <laughs> uh, let's just That's get how out you here. lose an arm for sure. Yeah. yeah. So we, we leave and we find we find a cave. Problem is there's jaguars at the cave. Yeah. So there the jaguar, jaguar attacks. Three. Jaguar attacks. And instead of letting the other people fight, I get in the, involved and I'm like, I'll fight the cat. You guys ah. stay back. I smack him with my frying pan and then the cat swipes at my arm and like hurts my arm. Character passes out. I wake up in the cave. They amputated my arm oh, God. while I was asleep. Jesus. And Holy I find shit. out that the wife of the couple had gone off looking for food and ended up getting killed by jaguars while she was out there. And then I pass out again, and I wake up again. We're like, we got to get out of this And the cave. other arm's jag locked no off. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm one-armed. The wife died from trying to find food, and then we go back to the camp that's destroyed by the storm. And they were, they were like, it's a good thing we left the camp because we wouldn't have survived this. So I guess... <laughs> Yeah. Leaving the camp was a good decision. They, that's how they kind of came off. But at the same time, I lost an arm and I lost somebody too, who was hunting berries and got killed by jaguars. Wow. I so. like what the what Nick said, and I think it kind of ties into what Bear said about the Telltale stuff. I, I also I feel like in a way the game sort of cheats to make you care about the characters. Like you don't you don't care about them because they're particularly well characterized, but because they exist. Like in I think a way, George was the only one I actually liked out of the whole group. Right? Yeah. Like when I had the same thing, sort of. Where it was like an agonizing decision. You're like, oh, who do like who do I take with me? But then I was like, why do I really care? I don't like each one of these characters is defined by like one characteristic. Mm -hmm. Garrett is a gamer. Uh, Teddy is paranoid, potentially like schizophrenic, and like Jolene and George are married to one another. And then yep. Steve is like Ed Norton in Fight Club. Yeah, yeah. Fight Club. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got such so, an Eeyore vibe from Steve, actually. Yeah, that was the only connection. He was so make. happy before he got struck by lightning, though. He <laughs> so was, I think he I would was, be, too, honestly. I mean, no, he was like, kind I of a damper. Because he was like, it was like, he thought he was about to die from being burned. Rain comes, puts out the fire, and he's like, I have this whole new look on life. I'm so excited to keep living. And we're like, oh, he's going to make it. And then lightning just like, bam, and then X's in his eyes, and he's just dead. Like, and then the, the lady, the wife, was with me. She's like, well, he went out honorably. And I was like, okay. That's, that's what bothers me. Because people sometimes get down on Telltale games and say, like, oh, there's like an illusion of choice because it kind of bubbles up and then all ties up at the end. So you can't really have hugely diverging stories. And in this course, you can have hugely diverging stories, but the disadvantage is that compared to something like Telltale, which can be like very deliberately written, 
you know, in detail, in depth, and really characterize everybody well. Here, the moving parts are kind of very visible, and you can see how it fits together modularly. Like, I had the same thing where, yeah. like, George died in my second playthrough. He got mauled by a jaguar right in front of his wife. <laughs> and then we get into the cave, and she's like, well, I guess we should try to get some sleep. And I was like, well, that might yeah. call for, like, some new dialogue. Yeah. Like, <laughs> if, if husband was murdered in front of your eyes, don't run standard let's get some sleep dialogue. It was the same thing when we were on the raft, and it was me, the paranoid guy, and the gamer. And there was, like, a storm that happened. Both of them fell off. And I'm like, which one do I pick? Because obviously one was going to die. We, I saved the paranoid guy. I let the, the big guy die. And at the end, we were just, he, just, everyone was like, well, all right, he's dead. No big deal. And they're like, all right. Well, you just watched him get eaten by a shark. But that's fine. <laughs> That's she right. wanted Don't to eat her it. own husband. It was know, like a snap she decision, just too, woke wasn't it? Up. Yeah. Look, to I walked fair. into this conversation with a pretty positive outlook. Now I'm like, <laughs> you're eh, maybe not so much. To be totally fair, there is kind of like a, you know, you get what you take, you get what you give element to that Jolene and George storyline. Because if you, right. in the early game, if you go out and like do an SOS signal, which you would never do if you were actually trying to survive, because that, you had, yeah. yeah, exactly. You're like, I, I need food that. and water. Yep. I was like, exactly. need shelter, food, water, or shelter, yep. water, food, baby. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's how I and, approached uh, it. I approached it, and these guys are like SOS. I'm like, no, we need water. We need food. Let's take yeah. care of these things. Then we'll worry about that. So if you go out and do the SOS signal, you actually find like a hidden package Ooh. from Jolene, which uh, has a little bit of flavor text about her relationship with George. It's still even knowing that out of character for her to wake up and be like, let's eat my husband. It's not like <laughs> she's like George is kidnapped me. Blah blah blah. It's it's like maybe they're in a loveless marriage. But still, right. even if you were in a loveless marriage, you woke up, you wouldn't be like, oh, sweet, like, delivery. Yeah, no, I got the one <laughs> where she was like, uh, I, like, I asked one of them when we were going to bed, why don't you sleep next to each other? And she's like, mm. I, well, he snores or something. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, whatever. I talked to both. I got that, and then I talked to him the next night, and he was talking about how he's always forced to travel and whatever, and he just does yeah, it because yeah. he loves her. I was like, oh, there's something going on. But it didn't really matter. I tried to choose the entire dialogue tree that instigates a separation of the two just so I don't have <laughs> to really feel so bad about it anymore. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's it's got a lot of diversity to it. And every every word that's spelled D-I, by the way, just for the sake of being you know fully invested in the mm -hmm. conversation here, spell it D-Y. Just, there you go. Just so you know. Um, I still think it's good, like... Likewise, I, yeah. I, I played it through twice, and the, fir the first time was because I was interested, and I also knew that we were going to be covering it. But uh, the second time, I was like, I want to see how things diverge if you make different decisions. Right. I think that I, I don't normally like to approach things from this angle, but I think at the cost that it is, which is like 15 bucks for an hour and a half, two hours of gameplay is maybe a little bit of a tall order. And, and a small short story coming on down the line. That, I'm actually, I will go back for that. I will I, too. I, in, there's no, there's very little characterization, I feel, in this course, which I found ironic because in the PR email, they're like, it has more words in it than Twilight. And I was like, that's kind of funny. But also, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not the most, like, heady comparison. But anyway, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. I think but, overall, um, discourse teaches us luck is a skill you have to learn. Ah, there we go. Mm -hmm. nice. But, uh, like... If there's no characterization, to just have that indie island one, which is going to be like a similar yeah, story, yeah. but with indie developers, I'm like, oh, I've already got preconceived notions of who these people yeah, are. Yeah, you know who they are. <laughs> right. right. So um, they, it, it's different if it's like, do you want to kill Garrett, or do you want to let Garrett die, or let Teddy die? If it's like, do you want to let Edmund McMillan die, or Ron Carmel die? I'm like, do you oh, want man, to that's Tim Schafer with Jonathan Blow. Does that sound like a good <laughs> option to you? <laughs> Um, so make a really good Dracula fetus animation, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. Where does the cat come in? In the, the cave. cave. Yeah, when yeah. you go to the cave, if you go to the cave. Okay, there's a storm. You can choose yep. to stay at the camp or go to the cave. I went to the if cave. You, if you go to the cave and you stay in the cave, the first time you wake up, like a cat appears, basically. You it, was, like, it had a bell on, too. I'm it like, has a great on? moment. Like, this is one of the things where I was like, why would you ever take the alternative? The, the cat shows up in the cave. And then it's like, do you want to grab the cat or let the cat come to you? And I'm like, I own a lot of cats. You let the cat come to you. Yeah. And then Jolene goes like, what if it gets into trouble? And I'm like, it's a desert island. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's in plenty of trouble. What's it going to do? Like knock over a vase or something? I wonder like, if it's because like I lost my arm. My character's too busy passing out from blood yeah. loss that, that yeah, I missed that whole thing. 
like miss the scripting on that probably. Yeah. What I did I did take a little bit of issue with the fact that a lot of times it felt as though like there were decisions that made drastic impacts. There were also things you could do that really didn't do anything at all. It felt like, for example, one that stuck out in my mind near the end of it. That was when I got to that tribal village after we had taken the hallucinogenic mushroom trip. We <laughs> yeah, voted for the leader of. Yeah, I know that just all sounds like you know totally standard narrative, right? <laughs> uh, we voted for the leader of the tribal village, and then sixty days passed by. Wow, we were just yeah, that's it, awesome. It, it got to that. like day sixty-five, and we had all just established some kind of four more system. There were only three of us left. There were me, Steve, Jolene, and the cat, and we had voted Jolene as the leader of the village thing. And I gotta wonder if maybe we had more people, there would be some sort of uprising that could have taken place because Steve pulled me over and he said, "Hey, I think Jolene's getting a little bit too full of herself, being the leader of the island here," and. It gets it gets to the point where like shortly after that happens, a helicopter shows up, and you start to you know talk about hey the helicopter's here let's go signal let's go get rescued, and Jolene starts to make the argument of no we have a good life here it's simple it's great we're all happy mm. and you're just like no it's a helicopter, <laughs> we, we win <laughs> we did it, yeah. and then well, that's like, pretty cool though that I didn't realize it actually got that divergent like it so, could last longer yeah, than eleven yeah. days but, or something I mean like it just. I mean, it, well, that is nice. Fast forward to just yeah, survive. it's just artificial, it really. I yeah, mean, like, well, I mean, otherwise it would condition? be terrible. I was yeah. gonna be like Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> that ended up being a lose condition where she still lived, but you didn't leave, so you lose. I don't know. I didn't play through that element of it. Oh, I, I just okay. said like, okay, Jolene, for real, shut the fuck up. We're gonna get on the helicopter. <laughs> oh, okay. I well, I, I wonder leader. if maybe that could have been a possibility if you accepted that and then like it just fast forwarded another three hundred and sixty five days, like. I got a lot of castaway vibes from it. I don't know if you guys did too. Like, mm. you you can get I'm to a point Survivor. Where, oh yeah, Survivor too, and and Lost. I mean, it's yeah, it wears its inspirations on its sleeve. I think for the most yeah, part. Yeah, very but very. Much so there was a there was a part where you're building the SOS signal with Teddy, where you can find uh, a disc that came from the plane or something like that, and they say let's call it Disky, and I mean, <laughs> gotcha. You don't get wow. more Wilson esque than that, but you yeah. Know, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, lots of. Lots of so different... glad that you make me eat the cat. I was gonna be so mad at you. Like when I saw the cat, my rationale was don't touch the cat because if it gets near us, somebody's gonna want to eat it at some mm -hmm, point, mm -hmm. and I'm never That's... gonna forgive myself for playing it. In comparison to Telltale, because I kind of had the same vibe. In comparison to Telltale, the tone is a lot lighter. Like oh, yeah. it's mm. people are going it's to weird. die and get mauled by jaguars, and you're gonna have to make it's... tough decisions. But everyone is kind of like. Let's do our best. It's happy you know? but dark at the same time, and I wasn't really sure where the tone was going to take me, so I didn't really understand what decisions to make based on that. Yeah, the tone that's what can kind up. of throw you for a loop when they approach death with such, you know, <laughs> a <laughs> candid demeanor of like, yeah. oh, well, fucking got eaten by a jaguar. Let's eat him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Normal. Uh, Discourse. Is there a way? Did, did anybody figure out at the opening encounter if there's a way to not have anybody's legs get chopped up by crabs? I don't crabs? think there is. I don't think there is. I've tried it so many times, and yeah. if you hit the, the crabs with the frying pan, they just they, go to the other person. No, or, no, they no, no, come, no. They attract they, the other ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They swarm whoever you hit, mm. and if you scare them with the frying pan, they all go, go to the, the other, other person. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Did anyone try to just ignore the crabs? Maybe they just no. go away. Because then, then, like ten days later, I had Teddy. He's like. I could probably help if my legs weren't so torn up from those crabs you let me get eaten by. Right. <laughs> Remember how much of a piece of shit you were that day? Yeah, exactly. The freaking crabs jump over them, you idiot. That's like, that pissed me off, too. There were a lot of problems where, like, these aren't problems, but you've made them be because adventure games. Exactly. Yeah. There were giant-ass like, mutant crabs, though, man. They were, like, half the they size They were kind of big, yeah. Giant and, and crabs. Like, the first ten seconds of the game, I was, like, I was very confused because it was, the Teddy is, you don't know he's crazy, basically. Yeah. And he's like, but is he crazy? you're going to... There might be a Teddy ending, but he's got to stop getting his legs torn up by crabs and blowing up in rogue fireworks explosions. <laughs> I was—I only say that because like I did pursue a lot of the Teddy stuff, and they constantly gave me evidence that this was all just like set up. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, I did I, a, found... I did a Teddy run, but he he blew up. No, he never died. Maybe drinking the Kool Aid a little bit there, Mathis. Yeah, no, yeah. I let him die in the cave with the gas vapors, which was dumb because there were so many people that could have helped me, and they were all just like, nope, we can't help you pull people out. Mm. I never had the gas vapors thing. I left for like a day, and then when I came back, Jolene was like, hey, did you get the food? 
And I was like, nah, and Teddy died. And then she's like, oh, everybody in the cave died, too. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, yeah, volcanic gas vapors or something like that. And I was like, I weird. Well, don't worry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jolene, is, she was wiping, like, barbecue sauce from her. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> they all died, mysterious vapors. Mm. <laughs> uh, it's, it's fun. I like it. I recommend it. I think it is worth. I think it's worth playing. And even if it seems like we've spoiled things, it's it's not like that. It's not like we just gave you the ending of like The Walking Dead season one or something like that. Or you know, right. the, you know, The Wolf Among Us. It's the the fun of the game is in seeing it kind of unfold. And then I really like the, like the presentation at the end is really slick when they give you the newspaper with whoever yeah, survived like and then. Too. Like, they give you the option to, like, upload it directly to Steam and share it with your friends. Like, that, that stuff is cool. Yeah. I kind of wish they, they had, like, a Telltale-style stat screen at the end. Like, mm -hmm. that would actually make me more likely to play it through in the future. It'd be like, oh, 90% of people made this decision. You were in the huge minority. I mean, what's wrong with right. these guys? Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that would have really been interesting to me is if there was actually maybe 20 total characters and it randomly picked a group of them when you That'd started. That'd be cool, That'd be cool too. too. Yeah. Yeah. Like different attributes lead to different experiences. Was this kickstarted? Yeah, yeah, yeah I made okay. like 40, 45,000 on Kickstarter, I think. Oh, I, cause I remember when I started playing, I'm like, this looks really familiar, and I don't know why. Mm. Also, I'm aware adding 20 characters would be so fucking much work. Oh, I can imagine. Fun. Oh, yeah. That would be nuts. Just saying. <laughs> at the same time, idea. right, it doesn't make it an invalid criticism at the same time. <laughs> right. Discourse is in early, or no, sorry, not early access. I, I dare not apply that label where it does not uh, see fit to do so. 15 there bucks. is more content coming, though. Yes, yeah, that's what it was. Uh, the Indie Island, whatever it's called. Which I think is going to be free. I thought that was, like, part of the, the draw of it, was that, like, if we hit this stretch goal, we can do this for free. I'm pretty sure it's going to be free, yeah. They're, they're making it so it's not just backer exclusive either. Like, everybody that buys the game is going to be able to do it, so... That's Special okay. edition DLC is ten bucks. What is this? That, it comes with like a seventy song soundtrack. Okay, wow. that's nothing big then. I think I was in like it's not songs. it's not story just locked. No, no, it's it's not more DLC as far as I know. Or I mean it's literally DLC, but it's um it's not more content. It's wallpaper, music, art book, got like it. Like a really long soundtrack, I think. Cool. All right, cool. So real quick, because I know that uh Bloodborne's probably gonna take up a Good chunk of discussion time, too. Nah. I did want you guys to touch on Pillars of Eternity. I know Mathis and uh, Ryan have both had their fair share. I probably played more than Ryan at this point. Wow, but... bragging about it. Well, Ryan, Ryan said he stopped because he's right. There's a lot of good stuff that came out over the course of, like, two weeks. So You, you may or may not have played more than me, but I'm very confident you've played more productively than me. I've played, uh, through, you, like, the you first might... three hours twice, basically. You might, I was say, you might be further than me, though, still, because I'm, I'm kind of taking my time maybe so Pillars just of Eternity up. is the uh, isometric RPG by Obsidian makers of Fallout New Vegas and published by Paradox uh, I think do we say this of... earlier in the show or was this beforehand we were saying like Paradox is making some bank mad right money yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they're doing real well right now uh, a lot mm -hmm. of the developers that worked on this were part of the old Black Isle studio part of the old like the old CRPG, Baldur's mm -hmm. Gate, mm -hmm. Neverwinter, Icewind Dale, uh, Planescape Torment. Like those developers worked on this game, and it shows. It, it shows. It's really, really uh, harkens back to those types of games, which is great. Um, I'm gonna basically say my piece and get out yeah. of the way because yeah. we're coming at this from two different perspectives. We are. I, I am a non classic RPG player. The only Baldur's Gate game I ever played was Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance, the like action RPG PS2 for game. PS2. It yeah. was pretty good though. No, I never <laughs> Dark I, Alliance was still all right. And I like I didn't play Divinity last year. Uh, so I'm coming at this from like a total layman's perspective. It's one of those th it's almost like looking at like a really big book on like a library shelf or something like that. And then you read like th 30, 40 pages, and you're like, I could really see investing like a lot of time into this and, <laughs> and getting like, a, <laughs> yeah, like a lot of rewards out of this. And like, if I invested myself, I could really get a lot in return. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's a little bit like Silver yeah. Like, I, it, this is a, a perfect analogy, actually. It's like I played Dragon Age Inquisition in November, and then I was like, I want to play more RPGs. It's like reading Lord of the Rings and being like, I want to know more of this universe. And then I picked up the Silmarillion, and I was like, oh. Like, I'm not ready for this <laughs> shit. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I played, like, three hours. It's, it was very difficult for me. I played on normal at first and basically, like, hit a wall. Because they don't really give you that much guidance about where you should be. They kind of tell you where to go, but they don't... There's no, like, 
be like level six before you come here. It's just right. like, you need to get here and kill the king, or you need to get here and like meet this guy. And I like was just beating my head against a wall. Like I would have a good first two hours destroying enemies, getting a little bit better at micromanaging my party and stuff like that. And then it would just, it would fall apart. I'd hit a wall and I just could not get past it. Like I would fight an enemy for like an hour, lose, and then just be like, well, I got to restart. What was the last thing you did? What's up, Kate? Hey, Kate. Hey, Kate. How's it going, Kate? Hey. She's Did you like a spoon? Of the same thing. Okay. <laughs> Did you like a spoon? Okay. Well then, okay. How's it going? Dude, how was the podcast? It's going well so it's far. Good. So far, I think we're having a good <laughs> time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> still some time in it. All right. All right. Love you. I love you too. This is an important part of the show for everyone. I think. Every every episode. Every yeah. episode, right? Um, <laughs> so in my first game, these are very, very, very early game spoilers. For people who are this concerned game is about long this. as fuck. So it's gonna be like eighty hours long. This is like two or three hours in. Yeah. In my first game, I um, I got a few party members. I got to like that first the Gilded Vale. Is that what it's called? The first yep, big the area town. with like yeah the town. Mm -hmm. And then I went east to. Did you do Cade. anything in the town? Yeah, yeah, I did. Like I did a quest where I like went down to the Anslog's compass and made the potion for the girl's sister. All right. So it's it's a e really easy side quest basically to get it like a level and then, and then um, yeah I got like a party of four party of three maybe and then I went east to Cadena 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 that's where yeah. I, that's where my target is right now but I've been doing so much shit in the little town okay so I, I went there and you get like another party member and then you fight a bunch of like phantoms way too strong for me. So I was like, all right, I'm not supposed to be here. I started another character. My first character was a ranger, and I wasn't feeling it. Because then, like, the first few people I got were all, like, not tanky at all. So I started with... That face. That's not true. That's that not true at all. Is, is it, that's you can, there are different party members you can get. Like, right, right. It, 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 that, that's the other thing that's deceptively old school about the game. Like, they, don't, they hide pirate party members for you. You have to stumble if, upon them. If you them. don't pirate talk to, like, some... Members. The yeah. first time that I did something in the town... I, I talked to like I got a magician, like a wizard. They companion. hand that one to you. But that's like they, you can't not get that one. Yeah. But then there's another guy in the town who is yeah. like a um, a paladin, maybe I can't remember. Some guy, he's a paladin or a fighter. I the can't guy remember. near the tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's a t he's very tanky. Yeah, but I didn't get him the first time because I didn't. Oh, talk oh, oh. Okay. Like I I talked to him once and he was like. Hey there, partner. And then yeah, I was like, yeah, what did you say to me? And he's like, oh, never mind. <laughs> so I was like, oh, what's up like, with this really? guy? You have to go back to him a later time. And then he's <laughs> okay. like, all right, we'll, well talk. The fuck the, did the you second... just say to me? <laughs> hey, like, you no, know. No, no. <laughs> this, the second character I made, I did get that guy. Because I didn't talk to him at first. Because at first I was like, this guy's a piece of shit. I don't want to talk to him again. And then when I walked out, he's like, hey, stranger. Like, you, I hear you need help or something like that. Anyway, yeah. so I got him that time, and I, had, I made a fighter class that was tankier. And then I did, like, way more side questing, and then there's, like, the first main quest thing is, like, you got to kill King Raedric or whatever his oh. name is. Yeah, yeah. So they're like, okay, go to, the, go to the stronghold. At first I went back to Cade and I lost <laughs> to the Phantoms again on easy mode. So I was like, oh, shit, I'm really not supposed to be here. Oh, and gosh. then I went to the stronghold. I got my ass kicked in the stronghold, and I was like, this game's not. It, it's very deliberately... For you, did you people do a lot that play those, at all? did you do a lot of pausing? At I all? did. I uh, first time I played through the game or played much of the early game, I barely paused. It was a poor decision. <laughs> Took advice from people. You got to be micromanaging your party every few seconds. Yeah. I was doing it, still getting my ass kicked. Right, I don't think it's a problem with the game. I think it's a game that's clearly targeting people who have some affinity or at least enough interest in getting an affinity for the genre that they can get over what's a relatively high learning curve. I it think. is. It's really. It's a really high learning curve. Um, it's. It's incredibly deep. Like if anybody played Divinity, you thought if it, if Divinity was deep. In, I was gonna say it sounds like no. the beginning of it is kind of Divinity esque, where it's, you know it plops you down as like go have fun. So the thing is in Divinity, like just to kind of get an idea for those who haven't played Divinity, making a character is relatively easy. You pick a class. You pick. A, you don't even pick a race. You're a human. I think automatically in Divinity, you pick a couple of spells, and you're basically done with your character. It's a 20 minute process maybe if you're really like taking your time um in and that's for two characters you make two characters in uh pillars you're making one character 
but it's like an hour process if you're being like good about it. You have to pick a race. There are six races. Each race has anywhere between two to five subtypes. Each of those subtypes have bonuses to certain abilities and stats. You then pick one of 11 different classes. Each class could have anywhere between five to 11 different decisions you have to make. If you pick a wizard, you need to pick four first level spells, of which you can only fit four of any particular level spell in your spell book before you need a new spell book to put more spells in. So make sure your spells that you're picking are good. On top of that, you need to pick your um, your class. Uh, after you pick your class, you need to distribute stats. If you play Dungeons and Dragons, it's the basic six stats: strength, dex, con, willpower. In this game, it's intellig- uh, It's willpower in the game. Otherwise, it's intelligence, um, charisma, Stamina. and something and something else. So six six of those stats you need to put. You need to distribute the points they give you for that. Each one of those, depending on where you put them, will lock away certain decisions you have within the game. You'll have skill checks, so say, for instance, you find this wall, and you want to climb the wall. Well, you have to have a might of 14 to climb the wall, otherwise you fail. Did you have enough might when you made your character? Do you have 14 might? Do you not have 14 might? There's a lot uh, of character building that goes into just building your stats, and after that, you pick your initial talents, of which are unique to depending on the class that you picked. So building a character is crazy. With the amount of things that you just described, that sounded like an endless bunch of branching paths. Do they really make an appreciable difference in the way that the game plays out? Because that sounds like it would be they make <clears throat> uh, impossible to implement some, all of that. So when I played through the opening about four or five different times, um, because I made four or five different classes before I decided what I wanted to, each time I played through the opening, it went differently for me. Wow. I would go through the opening, and they give you two partners in the beginning that are like tutorial partners. I've gone through the opening where they both survive. I've gone through the opening where they both what? get to There's yeah. an opening where they both make it to the Gilded Vale with you? No, no, no. Get to the past the, the cave, the cave tutorial. Okay. I've had it where they one die within the cave tutorial, the other one dies within the cave tutorial. They both die. They abandon you. Depending on your choices that you make uh, will totally determine on what you, like, what happens. In my most recent play, the most recent mission I did, I actually reloaded it because I didn't like the decisions I made. And uh, the quest outcome was totally different because I chose different things. And certain decisions are locked away behind bars. So you need like a 15 resolve to be able to make this decision. But I don't have 15 resolve, but I have a 15 might so I can be a brute if I want to and beat him up instead. And that will have different implications immediately and further on down the line, say if he lives and he escapes. Um, it's wow. very text heavy though. That's the thing. It's, it's, you, there's a lot of reading involved. Sunless in this. sea levels? No more, more so. Like way, more, more, yeah, way more so oh, than some Yeah, it's <laughs> me for a lot. with the character development thing, but that, oh, That it draws you lot. in, really. That's the, it, I think that's the first threshold so that ambitious. I really, I can't. It's old school. Yeah. It's super old school. And I love it for that because I grew up on that stuff. I play, I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for like over 10, 11 years. I yeah. grew up playing Baldur's Gate and all these things. So this kind of text-based RPG is something I'm used to. And I think that's, that's where the barrier is going to be, right? Divinity is for the people who want to experience a CRPG but don't want to deal with the bullshit that came before it. Like, what made... <laughs> C- like, it yeah, is, it is like the gateway me. CRPG for people. Right, if you want to play a CRPG but you don't want to deal with the stuff that existed 10 years ago, you play Divinity. But if you are craving that depth, then you play Pillars. Because Pillars, on top of having all this decision, they've built this world from the ground up with thousands of years of history that is in the game for you to read. I've already spent like an hour and a half just reading books that I found, learning about the world, why these empires exist, why they've broken away, um, why this particular little town that we're in, uh, Gilded Vale, is the way it is. What is... I mean, did you even read about the uh, the God War that happened there and why they're independent? No. Yes, yeah, so like... <laughs> Surprise. <you> yeah, <laughs> like there's so much... There's a reason, like, the town is so angry and, like, the, the killing everybody and, like, hollowborns and all this stuff. Did you know what a hollowborn is, Ryan? Yes, I, all right. I played. Did you read about the, the guy who, who put an animal soul in his daughter? No. Like, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, that alchemist stuff. I, I really feel like, like Pillars of Eternity, it's not a fair comparison to compare it to Dragon Age Inquisition. It's not. It's totally different. But I feel like Pillars of Eternity is, like, uh, like PhD level, like <laughs> statics engineering textbook, and what I need was something that bridged the gap between statics engineering for dummies, which is what Dragon Age Inquisition was, and then 
statics engineering for geniuses. I, maybe good. I, I, I should have played Divinity in the interim period. Because Pillars, right, but the way I feel about Pillars is the same way I felt about Crusader Kings 2 when I first started playing it, which was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I hear the stories of how awesome this game is, and I believe that they exist, I just need to get there. And it took like 80 hours to get there, and I was like, I don't, I, I don't know if without guidance I can get those 80 hours out of Pillars first. Or it's probably less for Pillars, maybe like 30 hours before I have like some solid footing underneath me. I don't know if I'm going to get it, which is not saying the game is bad at all, it's more like this is great, but like completely inaccessible to me. But you're right. It, it's really hard too. It's incredibly difficult. I mean, if you're not used <laughs> to these tactical battles, you're gonna get your ass whooped over and over and over again. In the I'm, review guide, they're like, okay, so easy is normal. You should play on easy. You should only play on normal if you have like experience. Right. And then there's like super hard. And I was like. Okay, but like, where's easy? <laughs> if easy is normal, what does someone who should be playing on easy play at? No, I was like, I, I, infant like baby mode, Divinity. where you just <laughs> let the game play itself. Exactly. Yeah. And I need like the casual mode where like the enemies just don't do damage to you. Yeah. Like, I need that Luigi. for like. Because exactly, in the yeah. game, in, the game there's, in Pillars of Eternity, there's friendly fire, and you can't turn that off. Man. Then that's the thing that gets me is people are like, you probably have your party. It's pretty easy. Just micromanage your party. And I'm like, okay, so I'm going to put my wizard at the front because all of his shit has friendly fire with it. Terrible idea. And then I put the wizard at the front, he gets his ass kicked. Then I put the wizard at the back and I'm like, flame cone! And he lights like all of the fighters in front of him on fire. And I'm like, ah. So I'm like, you know, so instead I have like this weird party set up where I'd have like three fighters and then I'd micro my wizard and like run him around to the other side of the fight. The and, yeah, he'd be like, flame cone! And then they would all swarm. I really like him. when you say flame cone. <laughs> I love it. I just imagine then, that's how you think I sound when I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> I, again, I don't think it's badly oh, designed. Oh, when I lost. Oh, Fireball. Yeah. yeah for a new player, it is hard, it is hard. to understand. Mm. For, for me, it's hard to understand. I shouldn't speak for all new players. I do think it's, it's one of those things where if you are looking to get into CRPGs, I don't think it did for me what I needed it to do, which is hold my hand. I don't and think it, this like, is what that's supposed to be either. I mean, I think it's definitely uh, set in its laurels of people funded this, to be the masochistic, yeah. like, unforgiving experience that people that are used right. to these sort of games want. They and wouldn't from... put up oh, so okay. much friction if not for that. Mm -hmm. Like, they mm -hmm. obviously embrace that very specific demographic because, you know, you mentioned all the reading and the difficulty. Those are huge walls that would drive a lot of people away. It, it is. I mean, it, at Paradox Con, me, Quill, and Arumba were in the group together, and when we got to the Pillars thing, it was just like an hour of us just asking them like little nitpicky questions about damage reduction and percentile damages and all the stuff that we grew up with. But at the same time, coming from, I mean, it's hard for you, and coming from somebody who grew up with these games, I see something a little different where it's not as hard as Baldur's Gate. The game has a lot of leeway to let you do what you want to do. There were a lot of times in the old games like Fallout 1 and 2 where you could get locked in a, po in a point in the game where you could not progress because you leveled up your character incorrectly. Mm. They, they don't allow that ha to happen in this. There's a lot more leeway for you to be who you want to be. And that's something I'm having a really good time with too where I'm playing this character that I want to play who is this, you know, stoic, badass paladin who will do everything but kill you, and I can do that, and the game doesn't punish me for that. I like Whereas to imagine that the people that funded this probably weren't investing in it with the idea of, I, I really hope that they put in those elements that literally prevent me from yeah. progressing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that no, was my favorite exactly. part of Baldur's Gate. But that happened. Like, that happened in the old school days where if you didn't have the right stats and you got three quarters of the way through the game and you came, I think, a good example that they used in an article I read recently, which is if you came up to this door that you couldn't pick, you didn't have the, the, uh, the mental prowess to pick the lock or the strength to break down the door, you were fucked because you needed to get through that door to progress the game. And that was the end. The end. Done. In this game, there are skill checks... Uh, they, they present in text where you have to break through the wall or whatever and you have many different options. There's always an option that's going to work, but there might be penalties for using the easiest option. Right, for instance, right, yeah. break down a wall. I don't have the might to do it. I don't have the tools to do it. I can shoulder my way through this thing eventually. 
what ends up happening is you get through it, but now all your characters are fatigued and doing less damage until you rest. Mm. And I think that's a good workaround from just fucking you over completely in the game. It's like game. the pile of rubble in Dankus' dungeon. Like, if you have right, a way right, through right, it, yeah. if you get, bring a shovel, you're fine. Mm. Yeah. I guess where I'm coming there, from yeah. is, is not that the game should be accessible. No, no, But I'm if not... that you're going into it under the impression that, that you're is... like, I'm going to be into CRPGs now. This might not be the best <laughs> jumping really stereotypical in. voice to use like, for people trying to get you, into the genre. <laughs> dude, that's me. That's so if you want to get into CR, I'm telling you, Divinity was an amazing game. And, and it has that super easy barrier to entry. You can just jump in, have fun. It looks great. It plays great. It's really good. And then if you want to go to the next step where you really start wanting to kind of get into the lore of the world and a more serious story and something that allows you a lot more detail, Pillars is the game for you. And it's, there. like I said, I've probably spent, I think I have like six or seven hours in the game so far, in this current playthrough that I'm playing, and I'm still in Gilded Vale. I haven't finished all the quests, and I'm reading everything because the world is interesting. Hmm. Did you go down to that dungeon in Gilded Vale, like in that yeah. area? Did you clear? I got, it? I got to. Uh, this is what I was asking you. Like, could you not have gotten into the game like four days earlier than you did? And sorry. then I would be right there with you, man. <laughs> yeah, I'd have like sorry, three, sorry, five sorry. hours of it. I was like, man, as I come to this puzzle with like some bells. Yeah. But I, I've, I've got all the flavor text from the area, and I still can't figure you, out what order to hit the bells in. Did you know that you can you can see secret things just by hitting the alt button and go into sneak mode, and your characters will spot secret things? I did not know that, no. So, yeah, you can go into, like, sneak mode, and your characters will see little hidden switches that'll open up secret rooms that'll have oh, pieces of paper. Um, but and they give you a little... Would tell you that. Yeah, good they thing enough to do a like, series on this, right? The two hints they give you is, like, the right part. bell has to be the first and the last bell to ring. Okay. So you have to find out the combination of... Right bell, then one of, like, what order the other two bells go in, and then the right bell again, and the door opens. The second floor, though, is all shades. So you wouldn't. Okay. But I, I, so I didn't have any problem with the shades. Like, I beat the shades with a three-party party. But it's, it's all you know what? It, it reminds me a little bit of, like, when you tell people to start playing, like, EU4 or CK2. Oh, yeah. You're yeah, like, yeah, okay, yeah. there's, like, a hundred different mechanics, <laughs> but you don't really need to know. If you're just going to be, like, military, usually big number beats smaller number. Yeah. Pillars of Eternity is like that, except it's like, no, you have to pay attention to every <laughs> single number. Like, it, even we were talking about, like, character creation takes forever. It does. And which is fun. Great. Exactly. <laughs> and, and there's a ton of lore. There's a ton of reading. Then you get into combat. You've got to pause combat, like, every couple of seconds to issue orders yeah. to your people. In combat, it's not just, like, you know, Thoric hits Barbarian for 10 damage. It's, like, Thoric glances Barbarian for 10 blunt damage. And like then the barbarian has damage reduction Oof. to a specific kind of damage, and He's then they'll also, it, mm. yeah. There's like there's there's oh. hits, crits, glances, and misses, and then there's like thrust damage, Six blunt damage, types of damage, and yeah, exactly. So and that's you, not even talking about like elemental stuff, right? That's all just the that's physical just, sorts of damage. Physical. Yeah, yeah, it's just physical. Magic is a totally different beast. That is crazy. But go ahead. They'll have, like, a combat log, which will be the size of, like, a normal chat window for an online multiplayer game. And then when your character swings, a number will pop up over the guy. It'll be, like, six, let's say. The combat log sometimes will scroll further than you can actually read in one. Like, oh for that one hit, there will be, like, more of a description than... It's not just, like, hits for seven damage. It's, like, glances for seven damage, damage reduction, blah, blah, blah. You know, Barbarian is stunned for 0 0.49 seconds, and then... Like, yeah. it actually is... It's crazy. Can't you, <laughs> you can't hide the, like, auxiliary damage stat stuff and just get to, like, the most important... I, I think you could, you could ignore the combat log or even hide the combat log, but then if you run into problems, you're going to be like, what, what am I doing wrong? Right. And you, it's almost like debugging a program. You're like, okay, here's the problem. This <laughs> I don't like, go that far. <laughs> this guy's missing, like, all this time, and then you go look at the enemy's stats, and you're like, oh, I fought this enemy four times, so I've learned that he has damage reduction against, like, lightning attacks or something like that. And you're like, okay, reconfigure, like, my grimoire and so it's not oh my lightning. God. One of the things to do is the more you encounter a particular type of monster, the more information you learn about that monster in your, in your log. So you can look at that monster and know, all right, next time I fight this monster... He's weak against this. He takes DR against that, but not so much DR against that. Here's a strategy I want to use when I come against this particular I, monster. I'm getting the impression, this is obviously hyperbole, but I'm almost getting where like, you see your combat log. It's like, all right, you popped out the number six. The rest of tonight is going to be me figuring out how much damage I did, and tomorrow I will do another attack. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to... You're like playing an overseas thing. chess game by yeah, mail, it's, right? That's what I'm getting the impression of. I know it's not really that, but it's just... No, that's no, what yeah, my yeah, head. 
honestly. It's, it's and I, I could sit here and talk about it all day. And like again, like Ryan said, like physical damage is totally different than magic, and magic is its own system completely that you kind of have to just. It's not hard to learn, but you have to understand. There's like spells you can use per encounter and per rest, and then you have to really like strategize. And if you suffer from too good to use syndrome too often, you never want to use your good spells because you won't have them until the next time you rest. So you kind of have to pick the good times to use them. And if you fuck up, like I did once where I had this beam of fire that was shooting from my guy's hand, I didn't realize it hit everything in its path. Mm. So I had, I had basically had come to this choke point where I was feeding the enemies into this choke point. I had my two warriors sitting at the doorway fighting the monsters as they came. And I had my wizard in the back, and I just did this beam of fire right through the door, and it just set my two dudes right on fire. <laughs> and, he, and it was a long beam. It wasn't like the burst cone. It was just a ray. But the ray lasted like three, four, flame five cone. seconds. And yeah, flame beam. <laughs> and it, like, it and killed everybody. There's permadeath as well. Like sometimes, is- your, sometimes your dudes will faint. So, sometimes your dudes will die. There's to- to- two different types of damage, endurance and health damage. Now, yeah. unless you turn on permadeath, you can still bring them back via resurrection, but it costs money. Oh, I'm, I I didn't get that far. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I, I mean it's 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 a it's a it's a difficult thing to kind of understand. Uh, uh, but when you get into it, like it's so re- it's it's so rewarding. It's I feel like it's, that's the trade off, right? Like the right. more time you put in, the more rewarding it is. And I hope nobody's getting the impression I'm just like calling you guys nerds because I don't get no, no, no. there's nothing like that. I like it's, plenty of this stuff. It's a particular audience they were going for, and they drove it home. And it right. it's like the difference between like. Like a casual person, like buying a car, and like a indie an car, going like, in, yeah, 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 yeah sure. exactly. Yeah, I get it. Like exactly. we, the normal person is just like, I want a Toyota, and then like some guy will be like, I want to have like this, yeah, flame cone. <laughs> <laughs> Go to your car dealership, flame cone. <laughs> and then some people want like, I need oh, this new engine has been introduced, and it's like it's got a bigger capacity than another engine, and like blah blah blah. Mm. If you're the kind of person that can actually like take advantage of those systems, it is like maybe probably one of the best games of the year. It, it, what what is basically is is like if if we were a magazine, you would have Mathis review Pillars of Eternity. You wouldn't have me mm-hmm. or Nick review Pillars of Eternity. It's a game for enthusiasts, and I think you should know that on the way in. Otherwise, like if I had spent thirty dollars on it, I would be I wouldn't say disappointed, but it's I wouldn't 45. have gotten my money's worth. Yeah. A forty five. You I, wouldn't I, have I gotten wouldn't the game if you had spent thirty dollars. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, if I could buy just the first two thirds, I still probably wouldn't have gotten my money's uh, worth. Yeah. But uh, per hour. If if I think that's the kind of thing it, it's it's a paradox game. You're gonna get like zero or one hour, or you're gonna get like two hundred. Dude, they so, don't have like a demo, right? Uh, no, I don't that think seems so. like a really good thing for people to be able to just play the first half an hour or something. Man, the first half, no, you need, like, the, All right, I, the I first two hours. Like two hours. Yeah, the first couple of hours, I think, would be good. Um, just to understand what it is. Because, again, character creation alone is just, it's so deep. The fact, like... Uh, I can get. I don't know. I'm not. Yeah. Gonna get no, that. that's yeah, fine. We got it. We got it. I think it. we got the idea. Pillars of Eternity on Steam. Forty five dollars for the Hero Edition. Fifty nine ninety nine for the Champion Edition. And ninety bucks for the Royal Edition. I won't get into the differences there. You can go check it out for yourself. Final game we want to discuss on uh, today's show is the uh, the the newest from from. Ha! <laughs> 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 I didn't even mean to do that. Uh, it's Bloodborne. It's the yes. uh, it's the it's the Dark Souls game that is not a Dark Souls game, but it is a Dark Souls game. That's it's, it's, no, it's only a not a Souls game because it's an exclusive, right? Like that's the idea. I I actually don't know. I mean, I think that's not fair to say. It's no. There's a lot of different reasons why it might have been, and I spitballed with Rob. We don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, so I thought it was because Sony was like exclusive. Here's money. Yeah. If you haven't ever played a Dark Souls game, they're known for being uh, brutally difficult. They are uh, just, you know, action games you... Action RPGs. There's, yeah, our action RPG. There's there's a lot to it, but for the most part, you can just go through and just treat it like a uh, good old beat-em-up, and you, you have a good time with it still, but... Eh. Like, a, like an RPG, right. it, yeah. like you, there are RPG elements, but I'd say it's more of an action game in that it's focused on the mechanics as opposed to act like leveling is important mm-hmm. and equipment is very important but the most important thing is just mechanical skill right yeah it's so, dexterity driven but not quite to the extent of something like devil may cry right yeah, yeah and this is perhaps the most dexterity driven of any of them in my opinion it seems like it really focuses a lot on straight up melee combat 
Uh, there's not yeah, really yeah. a lot you can do with like fireballs and range spells. Are there even like range spells? At I, all? I don't think that you have there a gun. is. There's magic. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, aside from the gun, the yeah. gun isn't even a gun, really. The gun is basically a parry. Mm. But, and yet, like, the Devil May Cry comparison is more apt for Bloodborne because Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2, it was possible. You could play them with, like, a dodge roll, like, dual wield setup and go, like, super offense heavy. But the way I played them, in a way I know a lot of people played them, was kind of like sword and board. Like, I have a shield. I keep my shield up at all times, except when I need to recover stamina. And then you wait for the enemy to tire themselves out and you hit them or you parry them and then get a repost. Bloodborne, you can't do that. Like, they have a shield, but the shield item is kind of a joke. You, you get it a little later, and you probably like the earliest third of the game still, but a little later into that, and the shield's just awful. So it, it, it's kind of like an in-joke to be like, this isn't Dark Souls. It's, it's aggressive or aggression-based and, like, very offensive as opposed to being defense first, if you wanted to do that. You and Nick have it. Bear, do you have it? I don't know. I don't even have okay. it as for. I mean, either. I'm have you or Nick, uh, Ryan or Nick, have you beaten the game yet? I have not. No. Mm-hmm. I I think I'm I'm still in the first half probably. Well, I've, I I've think beaten, I am too. I think I've you guys five or six bosses. So this is an important question I'm curious about. Is this a reason to buy a PS4, or is it only a reason to buy a PS4 because it's the only good game it has? Oh, that's a loaded that's, question. Yeah. <laughs> if you have I'm, I'm, honestly forward. though, is this is this like a system seller? Do you think for if people. you're the kind of person who is not who will look at the PS4 right now and be like, "There's nothing but Bloodborne," you should probably never buy a PS4. Like, that's, that's like a $500 purchase almost for one game. Yes. I don't I think, think that's worth it. I think Uncharted is where it will it's be. It's not worth. out yet. I'm well, saying, I, so what's your question then is, like, if someone who hasn't wanted to buy a PS4 up to this point saw Bloodborne, is this would they want to buy the system for it? Which probably right. the answer would be no, right? No. If you're buying a system for one game, I don't think there's any reason to buy to, to spend five hundred dollars. People buy systems for one oh. game, though. Halo is an example is, of that. Is yeah, the more like, apt question: Are you going to be I disappointed if you bought a system for Bloodborne because you love the idea of Bloodborne? I feel like you probably wouldn't be. That's a better question. I, I think that if you know what you're getting into with Bloodborne, you will love it. Like I haven't okay. seen anybody that likes Dark Souls specifically Dark Souls 1, be like, this is a disappointment. Yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty cynical person when it comes to this stuff. I had a really good time with it. This is the That'd perspective be, I think I wanted to... Like, yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's what I wanted to hear that you and Rob actually were talking a little bit about it during the uh, Magic End that we played pretty yeah. recently. Uh, Bloodborne is sort of the game that's trying to maybe take away the mindset that the Souls games have given to a lot of people, especially the general public, who perceive them as... There's no chance for me to be, uh, or to have a good time playing this because it's way too difficult. I know that from everybody saying, like, don't play the Dark Souls games if you don't like games that are really, really hard. So, do you think Bloodborne is trying to become more of the, hey, don't be scared? It's like, come on now, come on now, young one, uh, you, can, you can play Bloodborne, it's okay. If that was the way that they were doing it, that's probably a bit of an odd way to do it, considering this might be one of the hardest. I think mm. Bloodborne is, is much harder than Dark Souls so, 2, at least. Mm. Yeah, so that if that was their goal, that seems like a bad way to go about getting people involved. Um, I mean, we could speculate for a while about reasons they might have done it, but I'm not really sure could you, myself. Could you not like you're presenting them every time you put them in your mouth. It's like, <laughs> look, look what I got. <laughs> you're showing I'm off. I'm Here's, to... I I don't think any game is worth. $450 is what I'm trying to get at here. Bloodborne, I'm, it's irresponsible of me to say how much I like it, but like it's probably, as of right now, one of the best games I've played in the last three or four years. Better than Dark Souls I, 2? I, I can't say it because I haven't beaten it, and I, I have a little chip on my shoulder with Dark Souls 2 to begin with, which is not fair, but I do appreciate that Bloodborne is a much, much fresher approach than Dark Souls 2. Like Dark Let's, Souls 2 is like an iteration on Dark Souls, Bloodborne is its own thing that is like very clearly a Souls game, but not, not a really. Souls game. It's it's really a close Souls game. I mean, they just kind of have analogs for a lot of the systems in Souls. Like you know, You're, bonfires are now la- uh, lanterns. Um, souls are blood. Souls are blood echoes, and, so on and so forth. It's, it's still has it's, similar structure too. The systems are very similar, but it it is you couldn't. If this came out and was Dark Souls 3, I think people... I mean, they wouldn't have a negative reaction to it, but I, they'd be like, this is weird. <laughs> like, this is much... Right. It's different enough that I think it, it warrants a rebranding, I guess, but... Yeah, no, I agree with you there. And thematically, it's a bit of a departure. If they tried to position yeah. it within the mythology of it and, like, made 
some sort of an effort toward that, I think they could have gotten away with it, but I'm totally fine with them doing this too. I mean, it just I'm seems like the easier path, honestly. I'm assuming because Dark Souls 1 and 2 both had really hidden but deep lore, the same thing applies for Bloodborne. Like, there's a I hidden... Won't, I, won't know. I, I won't know until, um, you know, Epic Name Bro does, like, his videos. <laughs> it seems like... Like, there, there has been some crazy stuff. I don't want to spoil it. This is a game that I'm actually, like, a little bit more protective about spoilers. Yeah, but I mean, there's been some shit that has happened to me in Bloodborne where I've been like, I need to know what's happening here. Like, really? okay. like you know, in... This is, this is the most minor spoiler. I'm going to tackle it in a very indirect way. You know in Dark Souls 1, uh, when you go to the Duke's archives, yeah. there's that fight against Seath that you have to lose, and then it kind of like gates you within the Duke's right. archives when you wake up. There is shit like that that happens in Bloodborne that comes out of nowhere, basically, and is like, like this, is, this is crazy. Like, I, I, I can't really get into more detail about it, I don't know, Nick. You might you might have gotten to this point, or you might not have. I have. You'll, you'll okay. You'll you'll see it. I'm sure. But like the it the game gets pretty insane. But I still have no idea really what's going on. I would never would have had any idea what's going on in Dark Souls one or two without the help of other content creators <laughs> who like who read. And it's different because in in Dark Souls one and two, the loading screens have item descriptions that contain lore, so you can't help right. but kind of at least get some of it environmentally. In this, the loading screen just says Bloodborne. So and it lasts you, for forty like seconds or some shit. There, there are two. On it. There are Whatever. two. Oh, they are working on it. Objective okay. problems with Bloodborne okay. that give all of the fodder that you know people who are really, really adamant about PC gaming can can latch onto. The frame rate is thirty, 30. with dips, yeah. with which dips. I don't even I don't even really notice except when it dips. Like being at thirty, I think it's the kind of thing where I only notice it if it's up against 60 like playing dark souls 2 on 360 versus pc i notice a difference playing it playing bloodborne on ps4 i don't really notice but if i'd ever played it at 60 i probably would and the loading times are actually borderline unacceptable mm. third one and is it, the camera at times can actually get you killed yes yeah, so it, it's got a dark souls camera <laughs> gotcha and, like, you know I, you, i'm not gonna dark lie souls like, one when you walk up the the flying buttress, and that's yep. like the most dangerous oh God, part yes, of the whole game. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Step one, when you load up the game, turn off the thing that makes the camera uh, bounce around walls. Just have it clip yeah. through the walls. It's so much better. You'll not okay. have as many problems. At least they I have adored... that option. That's yeah. nice. Yeah, that's good. I adored Dark Souls 1. I loved it. I played it from start to finish. It took me a couple tries to get into it, but once I got into it, I like I loved it. Dark Souls 2, I never beat. I liked it. Um, but I'm, isn't the guy who did dar or directed Dark Souls 1, he didn't direct Dark Souls 2, but he did direct Bloodborne? Isn't that Miyazaki, how it went? Yeah. Correct. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, I'm, I really want to play Bloodborne, and I'm, like, getting weaker to the idea of buying a PS4 just to play Bloodborne at some point. Um, I don't know if I want to. Like, I'm still, like, I'm at that edge. Like, I, I want to, but I don't know if I can justify spending the money to do it. There's not going to be other games eventually. I know I'm going to want the Uncharted. Approach. I, I think if you're... A PC gamer, and you're if you're if you're like I'm going to buy a PS4 for Bloodborne, go for it. But if you're like I'm hemming and hawing, you can survive just fine yeah, with just PC can. gaming. But well, I'm gonna get the a catch PS4 is you're going to miss out on the console exclusives. I'm going to get a PS4 eventually because it has the console exclusives that I'm eventually going to want, which is going to be Uncharted, which is going to be more um, infamous. It's those are the ones I want. Xbox I'll probably never touch because I don't care about Halo. Man, it's a like big old sunset. paperweight over here right now. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, Halo Chief, Master Chief, Halo Chief, I almost so Halo Master Chief might have betrayed us. Did you yeah. hear? Oh. I have. Well, the, there was two different commercials, all right, man? Two different yeah. commercials. I, it's like, I don't story. care. Hey, don't, don't buy right? Halo 5. I'm going to yeah. use this yeah, as yeah, a freaking wait, outlet to say don't that. Don't, don't fucking buy it until you know it works. Don't pre-order it at least. I want yeah. At the same time, I also want to stream it really badly, like Bloodborne. But that's the annoying part. <laughs> uh, is like, isn't the is, is the built-in streaming on the PS4 that is it good, bad, meh? It's it's suboptimal compared to PC, but so, you don't need any extra hardware if you have a USB mic. But you'd probably rather just get a capture card and stream it on your PC. Yeah, and that's. I had a lot of fun with that. Mine died. I was trying to stream it. I did three oh, hours geez. of troubleshooting, and then I bought another one. It was three hours to set that one up. But oh, now, God, yeah. now I'm good. I can stream console <laughs> games again. Now. 
The long, the long and the short of it is that we can't really talk that much about. I feel like Bloodborne is one of those games that it's best to talk about as almost like a post mortem yeah. when like everybody yeah. has finished it because until and all then the secrets have been divulged. There's so much ambiguous stuff and so much nebulous stuff, but I'm having a great time with it. I'm I'm deliberately kind of parceling it into smaller chunks for myself to play as opposed to mainlining the whole thing. Yeah, I I don't know, man. That that's a personal preference. I've seen that there's people who's like 100 percent of the game already on stream. Mm -hmm. I'm like yeah. that's yep. fine. Bunch of people have. Yep. There's nothing wrong with that, but I, I want to, like, parcel Well, you're taking out. a different approach as well. You're not doing a series on it. You're not I'm streaming going it. to if I can okay. have, like, a freaking two-day period where I can rest my voice and recover <laughs> from this illness. <laughs> but, um, yeah. <laughs> well, what can you do? The PS4 thing is, like, it, it's, it's almost like a tautology. I feel like I play my PS4 a lot because I own a PS4. I wish I... I just wish it was coming to PC. I want well, that's but I, there's a little bit of dishonesty in that argument because I've seen so, I've seen so much like exclusivity is the cancer that's killing the video game industry. I've seen that rhetoric so much about Bloodborne, but when there's a game that's exclusive to PC, it's just business as usual. And I'm not trying to support exclusivity in the industry at all. I'm just saying I only really see it when there's a game that's not coming. To I don't PC. support exclusivity at all. I don't want exclusivity. Period. But I understand I both. Is. That's I, I just mean I, I don't think it should be and then it's not really a double standard, but like I, I've seen it's because Bloodborne is such a huge game and the previous Souls games eventually made it to PC. Yeah, that then this one's definitely not. Almost certainly not, yeah. It's like gonna uh, be if like Demon's Souls Demon's hasn't made it to PC yet, then I'm assuming Demon's Bloodborne. Souls, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Like mm -hmm. I, I just I, I take issue with the rhetoric that it's like, you know, if if Rebirth was PC exclusive, people just would have been just like, I don't see a problem with that. But because Bloodborne is PS4 exclusive, there's a lot of people who are up in arms about it. And it would be better if everything was not exclusive, but at the same time, it's like the YouTube and Twitch oh. thing that we were talking about. It's a way that companies can actually be competitive with one another and, and like create differences between them. It, you know, it's business. Yeah. I would rather play Bloodborne on PC for sure. If they can make a 60 FPS PC version yeah, of Bloodborne. Yeah, that's what it's about. And that's, the that's what it's for me. actually worked. And then, I mean, that's, that's uh, my argument is a little dishonest as well. It would be better on PC. That's like, just if, true. Like, that's, yeah, I know people like, argue, but like, it, it's just it would be better different. hardware. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, and, and if they didn't port it over with 60 frames a second, the next day there'd be a mod that allowed 60 frames exactly. a second. So. And the online still does not work for me. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I, I don't know if that's just my region or whatever. It's not like I live in a city. That has, you know, so you live in two Canada, and a half, man. I have two and a half million people in my city, and then I live three hours away from a city that has five Jeez. million people. And, like, <laughs> yeah, and, like, pretty close to Japan, all things considered as well. But anyway, um, I, I have never had a non-AI uh, co-op person. I just ate it, offline because I heard there were issues. I just wanted to play by myself because I figure I have more fun that way anyway. Is the uh, multiplayer basically the same as the Souls, where you summon somebody in to help you kind of thing? The, the difference with co-op summoning is that you, instead of humanity, you have something called insight, and you ring a bell, which basically signals that you want help, but you don't lose insight when the person joins. You lose insight when you ring the bell. So even if nobody joins, you lose that resource that you have to have oh. to fuel the co-op. Interesting. Begin. It's a weird design choice. Is there an invasion mechanic? Yeah. I've never been invaded, but I know how to invade. There's right. also uh, like a deliberate co-op, I believe, right? Like you can put in some sort of uh, instance thing that lets you connect to a, another mm -hmm. person you know. I don't know that, actually. Pretty sure there is. Somebody told me there's like a thing on the main menu you can do. I didn't figure it out yet. And how cool would it be is if you ring the bell you are opening the doors to either an invasion or a co-op help. You don't that know be, what you're going to get. That's, that's like how humanity works. Basically crazy yeah. Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to crazy Mike. Yeah. So <laughs> I wanted to mention too, like I've been a pretty big critic of Dark Souls 2. I'm not going to go into that now, but I do want to say that I feel like a lot of the issues that I had with that are not present in this. Uh, the if level you, design feels yeah. fantastic to me, and that's the one thing that I was really, really excited oh, yeah. to see. Oh, yeah. It's it's sprawling, it's complex, it's got interconnectivity in ways that I that's wouldn't awesome. expect, and it looks beautiful the whole time. So if you have a problem with Dark Souls 2 being like linear bonfire to bonfire, uh, Bloodborne is more like Dark Souls 1 in that there's a t like one bonfire is used for multiple different kind of like purposes. 
Awesome. That's cool. And it's unexpected but, the way that it goes. Like, you don't really know where you're going to end up from one. I don't know next. about that. Like, the way that it is kind of transparent, at least in the early game, like, you'll get to a lantern, and then there will be, like, an open gate and a closed gate. And then you go to the closed gate, and it's like, you can't open it from this side. Well, I guess I'm I just like, mean, I wonder what's going to happen there. No, I, I'm. Th that's pretty transparent. I mean, more specifically, the zones feel odd to me. Like, I don't expect where I'm going to end up next. That's true, yeah. Without citing specific examples, I guess I'm just sort of saying stuff, but... Meh, now I want it. <laughs> Bloodborne Damn. is a PS4 exclusive, available now. If you have a PlayStation 4, unlike Mathis, then you can play it. <laughs> but if you don't, then you can't. Ha. I'm contractually obliged to say this. Thank you for yeah. watching Roundtable Podcast this fortnight. A fun Appreciate. one. Yeah, this is a, we, no, we went no a little over time games. tonight. Oh, we're doing oh, Nick's Red games. games. That's right. Yeah. Uh, oh goodness, I nearly forgot. What are you doing over there, man? Go, go, grab us Nick's Weird Games, and uh, I'm gonna request. How about like a Randy Newman? How about like a Randy Newman? No, you got a friend in me. Cover yeah. of. The next word games. The, I wanted the punk version to be the official I can't, version. You can't just fucking no, spring that on me right now, man. You, that's that's See, planned you, ahead you said, kind of stuff. I was going to make a request this time and hope for like a, a police rendition. Very like rock reggae. Well, we're running out of time, so let's let him do something. A week has passed since we played weird games. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to grab one right from the shelf. <laughs> Only Nick can bring us together. <laughs> Nick will save our show, but Nick will break our hearts. <laughs> Thank you. He's bringing a weird game to the show. He's bringing a weird, weird game, game to, the, to show. the show. All right. That was, that was fun. That was beautiful. Yeah, I love the police. Oh, Honestly, I think that the, the transition is more important than the game at this it point. But... All right, I've got another weird game for you today. It is going to be another PS2 game. I'm um, very curious to know if you guys, any of you, are familiar with this or have even heard of it before. Uh, it was published by Atlas. This is called Baroque. Seen it. Don't know what it does. Don't Baroque. Know it does. Don't know what it does. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it does. <laughs> Fuck you. What happened? All right, so, Mathis, oh, if you were to look at this title, take a guess at what it does. God, it's Atlas, <laughs> so it could, it, it could do anything. It's Atlas. Um, my guess would be some sort of weird beat em up with, uh, entirely the, off. with the bizarre, like, range mechanic that has to do with him throwing his ball around. That's no, he got. doesn't throw his ball around, to the best of my ability. So I, I haven't think... played this in a few years, but I do have some experience oh, yeah, with it. Uh, this is a, like, an action RPG, almost kind of roguelike, actually, in this case, where you're going to explore a tower that is somewhat procedurally generated, and every time you get through it, you're going to try and save an item uh, for your next run, because when you die, all your stuff's reset. It ah, Rogue Legacy. Yo. Yeah. You guys want to freak out? What? So, you know who developed Baroque? Oh, who? God. You? Sting. No way! What? Sting Entertainment. No way! Yes! Perfect That's musical intro weird, for man. That. That's awesome! Wow! That's so cool! <laughs> they didn't know what I was going to pull. God they, damn, you didn't do that stink. on purpose, though. No. That's amazing. Stink, I knew today man. when I woke up, I was like, this is the game I'm going to pull out for the show. So that was a really weird coincidence. Huh. That's wow. Awesome. <laughs> Swear to God, we didn't plan that. It's like Ryan called. It, what, what we do is we, we do the podcast first before we actually do the podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uh, right. <laughs> We so like to already... block out six hours of our day to do this show. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, we, we talk we... about more paradox games. Or we, we, do, work we, out. we do a read through. We do a rehearsal, and then mm -hmm. we record. So I uh, never seen Baroque back in GameStop when I worked there. I never knew what it was. Well, that's where I got it, and uh, I want to read the back here. So, death is not the end. Dark, challenging, and wholly immersive. Baroque is a hardcore dungeon crawling RPG experience. A cataclysm has destroyed the empires of man, and it falls to you to fight your way down through the levels of the Neuro Tower. In search of absolution, you will find death in the depths. Yet learn the death is not the end of the story. In this twisted world of Baroque, it is only the beginning. Is there just one guy who writes every RPG description? Yeah. I hope so. Everything is like, you're descending into the... And then there's square brackets, Game of thing. catacombs, <laughs> dungeons. There's like, like the, the fucking Don LaFontaine of back of the box descriptions. He's, he's For everywhere. example, perhaps let me just randomly 
go look up the description of Darkest Dungeon on Steam, and we'll just see how many. See how it compares. Uh, mm. See how they yeah, it compares. There's a word here. a word pool that they pull from, and that's pretty much the entire. It's the manatees with the idea balls. Oh yeah, recruits. Recruit, train, and lead a team of heroes through twisted forests, forgotten morons, ruined crypts, and beyond. You'll battle unimaginable foes, stress, famine, disease, and the ever encroaching dark. I have no idea Sit why the heroes happened. against an array of fearsome monsters. Mm. But like all of a sudden, your lips are entirely desynced from your voice. So it looks like a Japanese dub is happening while you're reading that <laughs> description for me. It's just awesome. Now. Oh, man. The number one review of Darkest Dungeon is negative? Oh, what? That's a little surprising, actually. To... All right, hold on. Every, everyone's straight up just desynced. <laughs> that was very surprised. Why in the world did we just desync? I'm glad this is happening near, near the end, at least. Is... Yeah, well, yeah, everything's anyway. desynced. Yeah. Everybody's desynced. All right, well, anyway, <laughs> that's going to do it, I guess, for the show. It's pretty today. cool. You should check it out. Yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that. That freaks me out. Thanks for watching this episode of the Roundtable Podcast. These guys, you can't even, like, I, I don't think they can hear me anymore, honestly, so I guess we're just going to finish off the show this way. But uh, thank you very much for watching. we got to say a big thank you to our uh, $5 tier and above supporters for this show. You can go to patreon.com slash roundtable. Any tiny little amount helps. Like we were saying, if everybody just subscribed for a dollar a channel on YouTube, ads could go away forever. So if you want to support that ideal world, check it out. Thank you very much to Max, yes. Christopher, Casey, E.P. Diablo, <laughs> Alexander, Jonathan, Cadaby, Jeff Rush, Robert, Vaxed, Matt, Julian, Hired Help, Caspian, Crawdad, Kevin, Rumble Muffin, who has been helping me out a lot. Thank you very much, Rumble Muffin. Uh, mm. Maximilian, Smurfette, Logan, Ray, Ignacio, Full Grown Gaming, Simon, Kyle, Jabonis, Christopher, Garju, Batman9502, Kaj, Star Copper, Eroticals, Vandervet, whose first name I still have not learned to pronounce because I am a piece of shit. Laurel, Grace, Peter, Thomas Cashman, Michael, Zachary, Unix388, Sebastian, John Morrison, Michael, Justin, Positron, Morton, Scott, Urbane, Muscif DP, Jesse, Chris, J. Kyle, Pittman, Fred Durst. Fred Durst has made an appearance finally in nice. the uh, pictures yeah, yeah. list. A yellow forklift, Michael, Andreas, Dolam. Will the Foe, Kyle, Suicide Pretty, Zmod, Wolves at My Door, Jeremy, Eric, Dylan, Tobias, Salty Onion, Chris, Grimbo, Andrew, James, Schmidt, Chris, Graham, Will, Jay, Lindsay, Kelpferder, Sam, Christopher, Titan, <laughs> Luke, J.H., Paul, Nathan, Rusty Hole, Chris, Constantinos, Donut Overlord, Jose, Benjamin, Jordan, Brizzle, Brip, Andrew, 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 Sebastian, Andrew, Andrew. Cooper, Marvin, Eluk, Ian, the Awacock, Julian, Lucas, Dudok, 22, Jack, Tobias, Jack, a car, Doug, Hammerschnitz, Tom, Hugh Perry, Big D, Doc and Dude, Joseph, and Connor. We got to find a better way of doing that. What the <laughs> goddamn hell? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, how are we not happy about that every time that happens? Oh, I am happy about it. a big list of amazing it. people. So thank you very much. Time is money, baby. That's right. Time is, <laughs> Time is money, friend. Twitter.com slash roundtablepc for updates. We tweet about stuff periodically. We're also now doing the regular live stream broadcasts that is uh, typically taking place every other Tuesday over on twitch.tv slash roundtablepodcast if you want to go follow and check that out as well. And please do us a big favor. Go rate and review the show on iTunes. Just help out drastically. Uh, thank you very much for doing that as well. We'll be back in two weeks. Next show will be on the, uh, this is going to be the tw Third. No, 17th, 17th of April will be the next Roundtable podcast. Thank you all for watching. And, uh, Bye. See you okay. later. We got them later. all. Yeah, I was worried, but I, uh, we did it. We, we did, did it. a proper show. Woo, <laughs> get it ready. This podcast is entirely supported by you, the listener. To consider supporting us as well as seeing the ways in which you can become a part of the show, visit patreon.com slash roundtable.